What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 7. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. He only had eight days before old man Hokage took over his training, which left Daiki with literally only a week to work down the massive list of things he had to learn. It wasn't very long at all. Even with his abuse of the shadow clone training method, it was all but impossible to finish up the entire list. Granted, that was half because a lot of his clones were busy working away at developing the seal to squish Shursue's Sharingan inside his Shinkigan after the breakthrough he'd gotten when he saw Kakashi using the evil sealing method. But even if he'd been able to direct all his clones towards learning the jutsu and such he'd picked up, it would still have been unlikely he could learn them all. And so here Daiki found himself now, seven days later, standing in the backyard of his home, examining his hand, and the crackling aura of blue electricity shrouding it. Lightning release, chakra mode, perhaps the most important jutsu of all now within his repertoire currently, the jutsu that would go hand in hand with his bijou forms to increase his fighting ability beyond their limits and one of the cards he needed for the future if he wanted to stand a chance against some of the monsters that would crawl out of the woodwork later. And unfortunately, incomplete. Daiki clicked his tongue in annoyance. Or rather, it wasn't the jutsu itself that was incomplete, but rather he himself. The biggest problem with the jutsu itself was getting the lightning chakra composition right enough to enhance himself, yet at the same time not fry his nerves. Many of his clones had died rather grisly deaths over the past week in the attempt to master the jutsu. It was no wonder the jutsu was so hard to come by. An average shinobi would have killed themselves in the process of learning this jutsu. The real problem was, there was only so low the output of the lightning chakra could be lowered to, before it became useless as far as enhancements went. No, the real problem wasn't the jutsu itself, but rather, Daiki's body wasn't strong enough currently to withstand using the lightning armor without damaging himself. And if not for his innate healing factor from both Isabu and the fragment of Jellal within the seal on his neck, he'd at best only be able to use it for a few seconds before his body went numb. As it is I can use it for about a minute before I have to stop. He mused, cutting off the chakra flow and allowing the crackling aura of lightning to disappear from around his body. Well that's annoying. Daiki rolled his eyes and sat down on his backside, staring up at the sky. It really put into perspective how tough the rakage and his bloodline was. A's family were known for their stupidly tough bodies and endurance, especially when taken into account how high Daiki's own endurance was now. With a thought, he brought up his status screen. Name, Daiki Yuri. Age 13. Chakra Capacity. 187. 000 187 000 Low Tier Kage Strength 201 Endurance 281 Durability 201 Agility 201 Taijutsu 215 slash 500 Ninjutsu 350 out of 500 Jinjutsu 70 slash 500 Bukajutsu 140 slash 500 chakra control 290 slash 500 chakra affinities lightning expert lightning flashes water expert the sea parts before you wind expert howling hurricane winds Jutsu, advanced the breath hitches 281 it was by far his highest physical stat and all his other ones had now broken into 200 over the past week of training as well a milestone for sure, yet even with that and his durability being over 200, he could only endure the technique for a minute even with what amounted to regeneration. How annoying. Well, only one thing for it. He mused, pushing himself up and dusting himself off. He would just have to continue with the grind. The answer to all things. 
And well, it wasn't like the lightning armor had been all he had accomplished in the past week. He'd taken the time to properly learn how to use chakra strings, steal that sunglass wearing Dusha's chakra absorption technique and even the mystical peacock method and a few others. Not to mention he'd had quite a few clones working on the wind training he remembered Naruto going through and in the process of learning the lightning armor, he'd ascended to the expert level of the lightning release. Not bad at all, Daiki mused. Not bad, he says, Isabu snorted. A technique that has more or less been one of the reasons the Rakage's family has ruled Kumo as their Kagez entirely, and your only problem is you're not tough enough to handle it fully yet. I could have told you that before you even managed to get the technique down. To be fair, that technique wasn't actually that hard to learn. Daiki pointed out. It was actually pretty simple compared to some of his other techniques. The real problem with the Jutsu was being strong enough to withstand it and the stupidly huge chakra drain from using it. Because it drained chakra rapidly as well, that was for sure. Though that wasn't as big an issue for him thanks to Isabu and his heavenly star seal. It was no wonder only the Rakage and his family used it despite how easy the Jutsu was to reverse engineer. Without a body strong enough to handle it and stupid huge chakra reserves, it was more a disadvantage to use than an advantage. MMM. Give it a year or so, maybe a year and a half, and you'll probably be able to use it without any drawbacks. Isobu Muse. Not too bad a time frame to be honest. As long as he could use it properly by the time Shippuden came around and Akatsuki started to really make their moves, then it was kosher. Besides, it wasn't like it was something he couldn't use at all right now anyway. He could still use it for short bursts here and there if needed and would work well in a pinch. He really wanted to try it out with his bijou cloak as well to see how stupidly fast he was with it. That'll have to wait, you have a guest. Isabu dashed that idea quickly. Oh well. It sure is troublesome being so popular sometimes. Daiki snorted with a shrug. A moment later a shadow descended from above and landed a few feet from him. A familiar voluptuous, tan trench coat wearing purple-haired snake lady. I have a door you know, Daiki commented, raising an eyebrow at her. Also a doorbell which guests are supposed to ring. You also have a really punchable face. But you don't see me busting your nose in now, do you? Enko retorted with a grin. And you have a spankable giot, but you don't see me leaving my hand prints on it he shot back. Besides, not that you could even if you wanted to. Daiki added. Probably. Well, she most likely could while he was in his base and he fought her with no enhancements. Anko wasn't exactly a one-trick pony like Kurinai. She was the one-time apprentice of Orochimaru for a reason. He knew for a fact that she was not only skilled in Taijutsu, but Jinjutsu and Ninjutsu as well. He knew she was at least proficient in fire style as far as jutsu went alongside knowing some forbidden jutsu. Not like you don't want to with how much you were drooling over me before brat. Anko fired back grin widening and not at all phased about his comment about her but, in fact she proudly cocked her hip to the side. And will be seeing about me punching your face in now anyway since it seems you're not all that busy. That you know of. He said mentally. Even right now he had a good hundred or so shadow clones within Isabu's personal dimension grinding away. Though at least fifty of them were working on his new seal. Hmm. Now that he thought about it he'd need a name for his new seal? Bloodline Grinder Seal maybe? He thought idly. No. Isabu vetoed him immediately. Killjoy. I honestly expected you two to turn up here a while ago. Daiki dropped the banter and got down to business. I wanted to. But you obviously had some things to work on, Anko shrugged. As desperate as I am to get rid of this crappy seal, I've dealt with it for like a decade at this point. I can manage a few extra weeks. And since I look to be taking a break, you decided to pop over now? He pointed out. He'd caught her watching him over the past week while he trained, though she hadn't approached beyond watching him for a bit and then leaving. That, and by the looks of it, nobody else is coming by today like your little Hyuga minion. Anko replied, shamelessly not trying to hide at all that she'd been keeping an eye on him. Apprentice. He corrected her. Hanabi had really grown on him and she practically hung on his every word. She came over every day since the end of the exams to train with him. The only reason she wasn't over today was she had training today with her father. Apparently. Beyond her, nobody had really visited him. Tenten came over for a bit to let him know she'd be pretty busy helping Niji with his training because he couldn't rely on his clan. And Guy was left unmentioned, 
though he was probably busy with Rock Lee. And Sasuke came over for a bit to let him know he was going off somewhere to train for Kakashi and probably wouldn't see him again until the exams. Most likely, Kakashi was getting him ready for the possibility of facing Gara and teaching him the Chidori. Though he had no idea what was going on with Naruto in that regard. Either or could have a decent shot at facing Gara first. Hopefully he didn't just get parked with Ebisu. Granted, Ebisu would be a way teacher for him than Kakashi for preparing. He just hoped it wasn't like that because of how neglectful that would be on Kakashi's part. Sure. Anko shrugged off his correction before looking around the backyard. I gotta admit though, this is a pretty swanky place. How'd a kid like you afford a place like this? Some luck and a lot of effort, Daiki replied. Most of the money came from the bounty for Raiga Kurosaki and Sasuke owns this entire district since he's the last of his clan. He gave me a good deal since we have an epic bromance and all. Anko blinked. Oh yeah, you did kill that guy didn't you? She tapped her chin, then smirked at him. But the Uchiha kid, huh? He is rather pretty for a guy. Something you'd like to share. He's my male boo, nothing gay about it. Though if he were a chick he'd probably be hot as hell. Daiki shrugged. He was comfortable enough with who he was to admit Sasuke was a good looking guy. And as a chick would probably be a hottie like his mother, he'd hit that for sure. But as far as sharing goes, since you seem to like my house so much I can give you a personal tour if you like. I recommend my bedroom and my bed. I'm good for now thanks brat. Anko laughed. I'm sure I'll see enough of it once you deal with this seal of mine. She shrugged. Hmm. Was it right of him to entertain the idea of betting her when he was already possibly going to be in a relationship with Tenten? I guess as long as it happens before I get together with her, it's free game. He shrugged. Instead of letting any of his inner thoughts on the matter show, Daiki stroked his chin. I should probably reinforce my bed with seals. He mused aloud and grinned wickedly at the purple-haired woman. Have at it? Anko shrugged, not at all bothered by the implications of his words. Like I said, if you deal with the seal for me, you can do whatever you want with me. You can try and blow my back out and make me walk bow-legged for a month if that's what you want. Damn, this woman was something else. Somehow, the way she treated it so casually that she was his use to his heart's content as long as he upheld his sign of the bargain, was really sexy. Was it the submission of such a strong, beautiful, confident woman maybe? He put it out of mind for now. No use letting that thought distract him. Right now, it was time to partake in something much more amazing than mere cheeks clapping. It was time to grind. All right. So how are we going about this then? Daiki asked. Let's just fight. Anko replied. It'll be easier for you to get a feel for at least partly how my old bastard of a teacher fights through fighting me. I'll show you everything he taught me. Then later I'll run you through learning the things yourself. Daiki's lips twisted up into an excited grin. Now you're speaking my language. Funny. I thought your language was more along the lines of, Oh Daiki-sama, you're so big. Enko snorted. I'm multilingual. Daiki fired back. Good to see you're learning it for later though. You're something else, you know that brat? I could say the same about you. The pair of them, Daiki and Enko, were currently seated in a private booth at the back of a small dango shop. A favorite of the snake users. Anko sat directly across from the teen, lounging across the soft upholstery. The booth was large enough to sit four people on either side of the table within, large enough that the purple-haired woman could lean back comfortable. One leg crossed beneath her while the other was up fully so she could lean on it with one arm as well. Her other hand was currently occupied with multiple sticks of dango. Honestly, it was a very unladylike position and would let anyone that looked get a full view up her skirt if they wanted. Not that Anko seemed to care. Daiki wasn't one to turn a free showdown while he was off it was some ugly prick. But Anko was not. She was hot as sin. The purple-haired woman cracked her neck with a slight jerk of her head and a small hiss. You don't hold back at all. Even when it comes to chicks you want to clap, huh? Anko asked. That was nasty. If I wasn't as limber as I am that could have done some real bad damage. She was talking about how he ended the fight. It wasn't anything special or anything. He just grabbed her by the neck and throttled her before lifting her up by it and slamming her into the ground. Anko wasn't Orochimaru's former apprentice for nothing though and only ended up with a stiff and sore neck, whereas most others would have probably gotten whiplash at least. Daiki pulled his gaze up from the depths of her short skirt and shrugged as he met her eyes. 
What can I say? I'm a big believer in true gender equality, he smirked. Besides, I would have healed you if you got hurt bad anyway. The hell is gender equality? She raised an eyebrow at him before shrugging. Actually, never mind. Knowing you it'll be something stupid. Ha! Gender equality. That's almost funny. Probably was to her. You can't hit her. She's a girl. If someone said that, they'd get laughed the crap out of at best in this world. At worst, the woman they tried to protect in that case would stab them in the back. Because, you know, Kunoichi. Anko herself was probably stronger than a good 90% of the population of this world, possible more. Honestly, putting the banter aside, the fight with Anko really was something else. He'd fought her in his base form for the vast majority of the fight. And he'd been the one at a disadvantage. Even with his stupidly huge and ever-growing endurance, a mere three hours apparently wasn't enough to tire out the former apprentice of a Sanin. If Anko hadn't prodded him into using his heavenly star seal so she could get a good up-close look at it, he would have quite likely lost that spar. Anko was faster than him, more experienced and just flat out more skilled than he was currently. Not to mention, one of her main fortes in a fight was one of the few things he had trouble dealing with. Poison. Many poisons, actually. She could literally breath out various different poisons from acidic to paralyzing and just flat out toxins. Apparently, she had been exposed to many, many poisons when she was the apprentice of Orochimaru, even some he'd flat out created and gained an immunity to them, allowing her to incorporate them into her poison mist jutsu. Man, that thing was nasty. With his Shinkigen, he was able to learn how she manipulated her chakra to create the poison mist and with training, get the jutsu down himself. But it would be a double-edged sword as long as he wasn't immune to the poisons he created like she was. Definitely something to look into. You're going to poison yourself with dozens of different types of poisons? Over and over again, aren't you? Isabu asked, voice deadpan. The grind cannot be denied. Daiki replied. And that was all. He would neither confirm nor deny that question. But yes, he most likely was probably going to do something along those lines, though he'd definitely need some help with it. So, Anko broke him from his thoughts and looked him dead in the eye. Beyond the real nasty stuff that would hurt me using, I showed you pretty much what that slimy bastard taught me. That was for sure. More or less. She didn't summon Manda, for instance, which she could do. But then, he didn't exactly hold that against her. Manda was a pain in the ass. Strong as all hell, gargantuan and honestly, really cool looking. But, personable and a team player, he was not. God, he was so lucky his chameleon summoners were such chill peeps. I'll need to watch out for that freaky substitution. Daiki mused. At one point, he'd broken out the lightning armor for a test during the fight and took Anko by surprise. He gave her a hell of a beating in the process and thought he had ended the fight then and there. Only for her to literally shed her own skin. He hadn't known she could do that. Orochimaru's very on variation of the substitution jutsu that he thought only Sasuke and Kabuto had learned in the original timeline. But apparently Anko knew it as well, and it was one of the techniques that went a long way to making Orochimaru as slippery as he was. And it didn't need something to switch with to be used. Probably not, while it isn't massively chakra draining, it costs quite a bit more than your standard substitution. Anko pointed out, she seemingly remembered quite well that the fragment of Orochimaru in her seal had a massively lot less chakra than the original. So, what do you think? She asked, getting to the main meat of the discussion right away. Instead of answering her straight out, Daiki arched an eyebrow at her challengingly. That desperate to get into my bed, huh? He teased. Anko rolled her eyes. Well, you know, totally dripping wet for you and all that. She snorted. One thing he'd learned about Anko, though, was that she wasn't the type to back down from a challenge. And she had no problem egging him on to get what she wanted out of him. She sat up straight facing him directly and shucked her large tan trench coat off her shoulders leaving her torso more or less bare only covered by dark fishnet mesh armor. It hid the color of her skin, but hid nothing else, the mesh molding to her curves like a second skin and doing nothing to hide the large, perky smooth roundness of her melons. Melons which Anko then cupped in her hands and pushed up, making them look even bigger, and shook her hands, jiggling them at him. You've got a massive rod on you, brat. It would make a great pair with these big old melons of mine. I can't wait to wrap them around it. Screwing Karinai Silly had done a lot to take the edge off for him being surrounded all the time by gorgeous girls. But, edge off or not, 
There was no stopping his blood from flowing south at the sight. She gave him a wicked smirk when his back straightened. Course, with how big it is. Even these fat melons of mine probably won't be able to take care of all of it. Anko mused, voice glittering with a taunting, teasing edge. Guess I'll just have to put my mouth to good use then to get the rest, huh? She stuck her tongue out and licked her lips. Her oh-so-very long tongue. All right, fine. Daiki conceded and stood up. Let's go, he said. Instead of answering her straight out, Daiki arched an eyebrow at her challengingly. That desperate to get into my bed, huh? He teased. Anko rolled her eyes. Well, you know, totally dripping wet for you and all that. She snorted. One thing he'd learned about Anko, though, was that she wasn't the type to back down from a challenge, and she had no problem egging him on to get what she wanted out of him. She sat up straight facing him directly and shucked her large tan trench coat off her shoulders leaving her torso more or less bare, only covered by dark fishnet mesh armor. It hid the color of her skin, but hid nothing else, the mesh molding to her curves like a second skin and doing nothing to hide the large, perky smooth roundness of her melons. Melons which Anko then cupped in her hands and pushed up, making them look even bigger, and shook her hands, jiggling them at him. You've got a massive rod on you, brat. It would make a great pair with these big old melons of mine. I can't wait to wrap them around it. Screwing Karinai Silly had done a lot to take the edge off for him being surrounded all the time by gorgeous girls. But, edge off or not, there was no stopping his blood from flowing south at the sight. She gave him a wicked smirk when his back straightened, course with how big it is. Even these fat melons of mine probably won't be able to take care of all of it. Anko mused, voice glittering with a taunting, teasing edge. Guess I'll just have to put my mouth to good use then to get the rest, huh? She stuck her tongue out and licked her lips. Her oh so very long tongue. All right, fine. Daiki conceded and stood up. Let's go, he said. He pointedly ignored the way his pants were tenting out. Massively as if someone had stuffed a spear inside. That caused her to pause and blink. A little confused. Go where? Enko asked. My place? Daiki replied simply and gave her a hungry stare. Eyes having trouble deciding on where to look between her now glossy lips or huge melons. I'm gonna kill your sensei again. He didn't really need to see any more of her fighting ability thanks to the Shinkigan enhancing his mental perception and memory. And with the training over the last week, the lightning armor, his heavenly star seal and isabu, yeah, no way the shard of Orochimaru was going to be able to do much. Anko blinked, staring at him for a moment, before promptly shooting to her face, excitement palpable. Now we're talking, she cheered before smirking at him. Honestly, brat, we could have taken care of this ages ago, during the break at the prelims even. Probably, he agreed. Doesn't hurt to be careful though. Yeah, well it definitely hurt your enjoyment time. Anko's smirk widened and she sauntered over to him, hips swaying. You could have been clapping me cross-eyed and making me squeal your name for near two weeks at this point. And to punctuate what she said, she turned around to pick up her coat and bent fully over, even though she had no need to. Her skirt rode up on her full round giot and she wiggled it from side to side, taunting him. How the hell are you a virgin? Daiki honestly couldn't help but ask. Though asking that didn't stop him from whipping his hand out and smacking her across the giot. Hard. A loud clap sound echoed through the room and Anko moaned. She wiggled her butt again as if asking for more, before looking over her shoulder and giving him a smoky look, cocky smirk still brazenly in view on her face. Because nobody's been worth it until now. That didn't answer the subtext of his question at all. That reminds me, she blinked. I heard from the old man you have a real important mission coming up, huh? Even as she asked that, Anko continued wiggling her full round giot at him. Weird that he told somebody. I thought he'd keep it a secret for now. Daiki thought but shrugged it off. Something like that. He nodded. Though is that something you should be asking right now? Daiki asked, pointedly looking at the spear-like shape straining his pants. Yeah, actually... Anko's smirk returned in full. He asked me if things worked out with the cursed seal and all. If I wanted to play the escort and bodyguard role when you hit it. I don't need a bodyguard. He replied on instinct. The Hokage himself gets a guard detail and escort when he leaves the village. Especially for something like this. So yeah, you're getting one. Doesn't matter how strong you are, brat. Anko replied and finally stood up. 
hiding the temptation that was her bouncy backside behind her once more. Though now her melons only covered by mesh were practically in his face again. Seems he wants me to try and keep your hormones on a bit of a leash for this mission. What? Anko pulled her coat on, partially hiding her torso and much of her cleavage. Daiki was both relieved and disappointed by that. The new Mizukage's a great a looker. Seen a picture of her myself once. Anko shook her head and gave a faint impressed whistle. And the body on her, phew. I don't blame the old man for thinking you'd be hard up for her. Even I'd be tempted to get a piece of that cake. Well, the discussion here and now at least helped him control his raging desire to bend Anko over right here and now and make good on that hole, clapping her cross-eyed and making her squeal his name thing. What? Is the old man hoping that if I clap you enough I won't be tempted to betray the village and join the mist if the Mizukage offers to ride my rod if I turn traitor? Daiki asked sardonically. Well, yeah. Anko shrugged, unashamedly. You're an impressive guy brat, but the problem with you actually reigning in your hormones is the fact that it's all the harder to do when babes like that actually throw themselves at you. Hell, you're literally gonna fight and kill one of the Sanin just because you wanna bounce me around on that sausage of yours, much less chakra or not, that's still Orochimaru. Getting mixed signals here. You know, you're the one saying I should have splattered shade Petamaru ages ago. Daiki pointed out. Anko shrugged. Not saying I didn't, just that it doesn't change how crazy that is. She shook her head. Fighting freaking Orochimaru because you wanna clap me? You're a crazy kid. A crazy kid that you're gonna be calling daddy not long from now. Daiki snorted. Anko dropped the Mizukage discussion then and grinned back at him. Sounds like a fun time, daddy. She wiggled her eyebrows. This woman was seriously going to get it. After paying their bill at the dango shop, they left the building behind, which was really more Anko's bill than Daiki's because man did she eat a lot of dango. Well, at least he knew where her massive knockers came from. They were sponsored by Dango. They headed for his home after that, and as soon as they were over the threshold, Daiki wasted no time in activating the multitude of seals he'd placed over the property. Well, the ones that weren't already active. He wasn't really sure if Chakra would leak or not, or if it would even be strong enough to be felt from any distance, but he sure as hell wasn't taking any chances. Orochimaru was lurking out there somewhere he could be in the village right now. Odds were, he was not, but it paid to be safe than sorry, so he had the seals on his property masking any chakra fluctuations so on the off chance, Orochimaru or one of his agents would never sense his own chakra, and get an inkling that he could actually do this, which would put Sasuke in danger. All right? Anko looked around the main garden out front, as he closed the gates to his property and finished activating the seals. So how do we go about this? Do you need to draw up a seal or something? Usually something like that, Daiki replied with a shrug. Focusing the consciousness into a seal wasn't exactly a low-tier skill. I don't need that though. Let it be said that the benefits of being a Jinchuriki seem to be never-ending. He had the innate ability already to project himself into his own seal thanks to the connection between him and Isabu, and he could apply it to others as long as there wasn't something blocking him from getting in. And he was pretty sure he could get in with his eyes as well at this point. Anko raised a brow at him. That right? She asked, how come? He grinned, jabbing a thumb at his chest. Cause, I'm the Sambai Jinchuriki-sama baby. I'm a natural born badass, he boasted. A natural born headcase more like. Isabu snorted. That too. A uh, who? The purple haired special Jonin replied dryly. So where to then? Out here or out back where we sparred? Doesn't really matter, Daiki shrugged. The fight will take place on the mental plane and won't really affect the physical one. So we may as well be comfortable and go sit on my awesomely comfy couch. Honestly, this is kind of surreal, you know? She laughed. Relaxing on the couch while getting rid of the thing that's been tormenting me for years. You really know how to throw a girl through a loop, don't you? Never let him know your next move. Daiki's grin widened before beckoning her to follow him inside. Isabu's clone was still inside the pond having a lovely old time, and would keep an eye out if anything happened around the premises, as always. Anko whistled as they entered the main hall. Is this mahogany? Do you know how much this crap costs? She asked, admiring the walls of the hallway. Really does pay to have a lil uchiha but buddy ha brat? Pays to be awesome you mean. Daiki wasn't really phased homo jokes were as old as time where he came from, or at least much older than he was, it took a man comfortable in his own sexual orientation to discuss the looks and such of other men. 
He'd definitely make a hot chick though, I do wonder though, do you think Sasuko would be stacked or slender? He mused aloud. Anko gave a barking laugh. Stacked? She answered, rather swiftly at that. To know if you ever saw her, but the Uchiha kid's mother, Makoto was a real looker and she could have given me a run for my money when it came to tit size. You'd think she was part Hyuga. Those tidy whitey eye chicks are always sporting massive racks. Though not that I need to tell you that, huh? She gave him a knowing look. Huh. Good to know. Daiki mused before shrugging. What a lost opportunity. Too bad Sasuke's not a chick. Though a bromance isn't bad either. In fact, it's probably better to have a bro. There are tons of stacked chicks about here anyway. Shame about Makoto though. And Kushina, obviously. That would have been an amazing threesome. Something worth bragging about. Banging the mothers of two future demigods? Or gods? You know, it actually wasn't all that clear. Kagaya was a dimension creating and destroying, planet wiping bona fide goddess more or less. And Naruto and Sasuke beat her, with help sure, but they beat her. And they, or at least Naruto had access to the creation of all things come that point, he could create objects from his chakra, stop the gate of death from killing guy, create literal new eyes in the eye sockets of people and connect them without issue and more. Were Naruto and Sasuke gods themselves by the end? They at least had the abilities of one's literal creator god Naruto. Just remembering the monsters that would come later was beginning to make him antsy. A tap on his shoulder broke him from his thoughts and he looked over his shoulder to see Anko giving him an odd look. Almost concerned. Yo brat, you okay? She asked. You just zoned out there and got all quiet. Even stopped walking. Oh right. This totally wasn't the time to be focusing on that. Besides, he still had a few years to grind until his muscles could flex upon a god. Yeah, I'm good. Just thinking about something that came to mind there. He waved her off. Come on. It isn't really important right now. Ahu. Anko's raised eyebrow told him. She did not believe him. Daiki ignored it and lead her on. Through the halls and to his living room. Damn. I have to admit. You have good taste, kid. Anko looked around his living room to the large fireplace, soft shag carpets, expensive furniture, large television, dimmer lights, the works, kids who have placed of their own at your age, generally live in pigsties, but look at you, living your best life, huh? What do you think you're here for? Daiki teased with a smirk, good mood returning as a sense of pride filled him. It maybe wasn't all that big of a thing to take pride in compared to being able to fire off a massive energy bomb that could wipe out thousands in an instant. But he'd always been an orphan. Twice over in fact, both in this life and his other. He'd never had a proper home to call his own. His dingy little apartment didn't count. He didn't even like inviting people over their previous to moving in here. So he put a lot of effort into building up his home into a living space he could be proud of. And while he hadn't gotten everything he wanted so far, a lack of gaming consoles being amongst the things missing in his sweet pad, he'd done some good work here. And he was proud. The garden and pond is nice, I do admit, you did good work with that. Isabu praised him. The giant turtle boy did like his pond, that was for sure. You have your lusting after females and precious grind. I have relaxing in some nice water. We are not the same. Isabu pointed out. Anko snorted. Is that what the shag carpets are for? She asked in return, bending down to run her hand through the fabric. It's really soft and cushiony. Making sure we don't hurt our knees, huh? Not really, he just liked shag carpets. He'd always hated wooden flooring or tiled flooring growing up because of cold mornings on his bare feet. Shag carpets were nice, soft and warm. But he wasn't going to tell her that. That was for sure. You don't seem all that bothered by it. Daiki pointed out. In fact, I'd say it's a bit off that your mind went right there first. I've got no illusions to what's gonna happen soon, kid. Once the seal is taken care of, or is the little games we've been playing not been clue enough? Anko rolled her eyes. And you're gonna have free reign with me. No way for a second, I won't believe you aren't gonna have me between your knees all submissive like. I mean, you're not wrong. Daiki shrugged. Lamely. Exactly. Anko huffed in amusement. I bet Kurinai got the same treatment, right? Pretty much, he nodded. Though not really in here, we spent most of the time in my bed. That sounds awfully boring, Anko pointed out, raising an eyebrow at him. I mean, I know she's a cold fish personality-wise, but ouch, that explanation was dry. 
The dirty talk was pretty boring, I do admit, it was basically all the same thing. The submissiveness was great and doing whatever I wanted with her even better. But she didn't have much going on upstairs to formulate some good old words. It may have been his ego talking. But he sure did love the idea of girls squealing out lots of dirty talk about how great and amazing he was. Some would call that a coping mechanism for hiding from your own insecurities. But I won't. Isabu commented. He just did though. Alright, so he needed the hype to keep going and make even himself believe his own boasts and making his plans work out. He was self-aware enough to know that, even if he pointedly ignored it and lived in his own little illusion, he needed to believe he could accomplish what he needed to, otherwise it would be impossible. Taking Kagaya out of the equation, Madara was a monster, capable of defeating the reigning Kage with ease. Slapping around all nine Bijou, alongside Naruto, Sasuke and Gara. A Kage with little effort. Without the deus ex machina that was Ashura and Indra's souls being attached to Naruto and Sasuke and being able to give them a power-up boost, nobody currently alive in this world stood a chance against even mortal Madara. Never mind Six Paths Madara. Regular old Daiki and Isabu could never defeat him. But, it was a different story for the legendary Sanbaisama grind master Daiki, who grew stronger every day learned new techniques as he breathed and was so amazing and powerful people bowed in awe. That was the kind of figure he had to be to defeat Madara. Because in the end, even with the powers of Ashura and Indra, Naruto and Sasuke were still at a disadvantage against Madara. If not for Kagaya ganking him, he probably would have won. Thankfully, Daiki's heavy mood didn't last for long and he was able to bury the thoughts to the bottom once again. Women were a man's greatest coping mechanism and he had a hell of a woman right beside him. Huh, how sad. You he really failed to deliver fully, huh? Anko shook her head and clicked her tongue. How disappointing. But really, it's you he after all. She's a bit of a lush. She then shrugged her coat off, draping it over the arm of his couch and leaving her only in her tight, short orange mini skirt that came down to mid-thigh at best, and her mesh top, the contours of her large, perfectly shaped melons obvious to his eyes through the mesh. So how are we doing this then? Enko asked. Blood rushed south and all thoughts from before were swept over by the wave of red that shot down. Daiki licked his lips and walked past her to sit on the couch, spreading his legs a bit. I just need access to the seal, so why not come have a seat here then? He pat his lap. Enko stared at him for a moment, before grinning impishly. All right, daddy. She rolled the word with her tongue and fluttered her eyelashes at him. It was almost a bit odd to see such an act on such an abrasive, confident, and strong wa. Anko reached down, grasped her mesh shirt at the top of her skirt, and promptly pulled it up over her head in one motion, leaving her torso bare, then turned and deposited her full, luscious rear into his lap. You know that does bring up the question, Isabu mused before he could truly take in and enjoy the sights and the feeling of this gorgeous woman in his lap. You are looking to empower your allies for later as well. When we crush this shard of Orochimaru, do you want its chakra for your own? Or shall we give it to Anko to empower her? For you, it would be a few weeks of effort, but for her, it would be months of hard work at least. What brought up that question though? Madara. Isabu supplied helpfully. Honestly, it was kind of hard to really think that through properly at the moment. And not because he was all that hungry for more of Orochipedo's chakra for a decent boost. It could encapsulate not only his pursuit of strength and ever-constant growth, but the wonderful motion of her delicious rear end gyrating against him. Beautiful and powerful all in one. Well, at least we know what word you're not allowed to say around father's crimson gourd. Isabu deadpanned. True. But that was all the mental power he could spare for that line of thought at the moment. He had to focus on other things. You know, I was kind of expecting you to cop a good feel before we got right into Dash. Anko leaned into him, back resting against his chest and began teasingly, but was cut off by his hands winding around her waist and coming up to cup her large melons. They were so soft his hands just sunk into them, yet springy at the same time, and despite their sheer size and weight so perky, Kunoichi really would be hated by women back in his other life. Heh. There you go, Anko chuckled throatily. Get a good feel of these fat melons of mine and get real motivated, kid. They're all yours once you deliver on your end of the deal. I'll get right on that, Daiki promised. 
but he couldn't just leave things like this, now could he? Not after she'd gotten him all riled up. It wouldn't be fair if it was him alone. He had something in mind just for her. Something Karinai served as a practice dummy for and he perfected over the last week when he finally got a hold of the lightning chakra mode. Damn. No wonder you he ended up like a fish, that was crazy. Anko murmured in a daze. Every few seconds, a shudder running through her body as pleasure spasmed through her. It took her a decent little bit to gain enough motor function to look over her shoulder at him. Was that lightning chakra? Where the hell? Did you learn to do that? Practicing with Kurinai? Daiki grinned at her smugly, a flush of manly pride burning in his chest at the slovenly look on her face. And if you think that was crazy, just wait till I do it while I'm clapping you senseless. Anko shivered. Damn, that'll be insane, she admitted, before a grin spread across her face just like his own. Maybe we should just throw you at female prisoners at the TNI, that'd be a riot. Honestly, this woman really had zero compunctions with basically doing anything to enemies of Kanoha. The voluptuous snake mistress licked her lips. Before they get a taste of that, though, you'll be wrecking me first, I guess. Haha. -ha. Not sure if I'm dreading it or looking forward to it now after that. The power of smugness compelled him to lean forward and capture her lips with his own. When he pulled back, there was another flushed, dazed look on her face. First, I have to take care of something, though. He forced himself to calm down. For the moment, I'm going inside you now, Daiki declared. It took a good few moments before he managed that. Or rather, he was so pent up, he couldn't focus on the process at all and utterly failed multiple times in a row. Fumbled it really. So Isabu took it upon himself to do the heavy lifting on that part himself and complete the bridge. But he had it way easier than Daiki obviously since he was already inside a mental plane and was predisposed to being good at it with all his experience being sealed and all. You keep telling yourself. The towering form of Isabu deadpanned at him from above. They were currently inside Daiki's own seal space. Isabu had smartly decided to bring him here first upon connecting to Anko's seal. To prepare before heading into Anko's and confronting Orochimaru. Get ready. I'll open the connection in a moment. Isabu said seriously before he could reply. Do not give him any chance to counter. Go 100% and more from the get-go and destroy him before he can do anything. You say that like I planned on anything else. Daiki smirked, facing towards the connection. Really, it wasn't anything grand. It was just manifested as a large metallic door at the edge of the sealed space. He wasted no more time and got right down to it. First, he focused on the seal on his neck. It pulsed and opened up, spreading lightning bolt like marks out across his body. Second, he focused on his connection with Isabu. A moment later, familiar crimson red chakra bubbled into existence around his body, forming into a cloak with three thick swaying chakra tails behind him. But he wasn't just done there. With his three-tailed cloak and heavenly star seal enhancing him massively, he focused on his own chakra personally. His chakra sparked into lightning and spread over his body, filling his crimson-red chakra cloak with sparking bright blue bolts of power. It hurts, Daiki noted. Even in his mental body, God, it hurt really bad. And if not for Isabu helping him out a bit with controlling his chakra, he wouldn't even be able to stack these three together right now. It was only in here that he could to be honest. All right, I'm opening the connection now. Isabu announced once he was ready. As soon as he said so, Daiki began running through hand seals. A set of hand seals for a Jutsu Orochimaru himself would be very familiar with. The original, at least. The huge metallic doors slid open and at the very same moment, Daiki finished his hand seals and punched both fists forward. Ice style. Twin black dragon blizzard, he shouted. Drawing on the chakra armor over his torso, Daiki lashed out with both of his fists. And from them, a pair of massive serpentine black dragons with glowing red eyes erupted, shooting through the air, roaring towards the open doorway. Last time against Orochimaru, he'd made a combination jutsu with a clone who fired off the lightning style. Electromagnetic murder jutsu he knew at the same time and clad the dragons in lightning chakra. This time was different though. He full-on directed the lightning from his lightning chakra mode into the black dragons. And that was not all. The sheer scope of the dragons and lightning were on another level. Before, 
he'd used only barest amounts of Isaboost Chakra and the base Cursed Seal Boost. Now he was using his full on three-tailed cloak version 1 and his upgraded Heavenly Star Seal. The opening of the doorway connecting to Anko's sealed space was shrouded from view a split moment later as the dragons exploded, forming into a massive jet black hurricane filled with shrieking lightning. And they were not done there. At the same time Daiki was unleashing his jutsu, Isabu cocked his head back, blue and red chakra swirling into existence, forming together and forming into a huge pitch black sphere in front of his face. Vijudama! Isabu roared, and then he fired. As soon as the tailed beast bomb made contact with the massive jet black lightning and shrouded hurricane, it too exploded, forming into a massive eruption of energy that traveled through the opening. The sheer noise coming from the detonated attacks was so loud it drowned out all else, and if Daiki were not as enhanced as he was right now, the shock waves would have blown him off of his feet. This was always the plan, an alpha strike to take out the shade of Orochimaru without ever giving him a chance to fight back. Everything else were just preparations in case the Alpha Strike failed. Orochimaru was a slippery bastard like that after all. But, since Orochimaru was stuck inside a sealed space, a crude, rudimentary one at that, and they were the ones opening the connection. They had the advantage. And Daiki. And Isabu were smart guys like that, not giving their enemy a chance to fight back if they could help it. Daiki himself was a true nukneen he, I made a punny. He chuckled as he admired the gargantuan explosion of power that could have probably wiped out a smaller village. Honestly, he should really be looking away right now with sunglasses and walking away. That was what the cool guys did after all. But he wouldn't give Orochimaru even the slightest tiny fraction of a chance of turning any of this around. Even if it meant he lost cool points. With his eyes active and keenly observing and his senses spread to the utmost limit, Daiki, Alongside Isabu peered through the connection and waited. And waited. It took over a minute for the explosion from their attacks to die down. But when it did, and after a few moments, they were unable to sense or see anything. Anything that is, but Chakra. It's dead. Isabu announced, tension leaving his massive frame as the huge turtle bijou lay down on his arms. I can feel the Chakra the same way I did when I destroyed the one who was inside your own seal. Daiki stared through the opening for a moment, before slowly. He grinned widely and rubbed his hands together eagerly. Sweet. Now I can get back to my date. Booty call. Isabu corrected helpfully. That too. Daiki nodded in agreement. Papa gonna get laid. Isabu rolled his eyes. Lovely. Before that though, have you decided? The bijou asked. Do you want the chakra or do you want to give it to your booty call? All right, yeah. Daiki pondered it for a moment before shrugging. Give it to her. He decided. She'd suffered with the cursed seal for over a decade now. After being abandoned by Orochimaru and had been treated with suspicion because of her connection to him for a long time. By many in the village. She ought to get something more out of it than just finally getting to use the seal for her own benefit. It wasn't long later after Isabu had broken down Orochimaru's leftover chakra and directed it into Anko's chakra network to meld with her own and become hers, that the genin and future Hokage returned to the conscious world. To find a purple-haired bombshell of a vixen gyrating on his lap. And not in the sexy way. What did you do? She panted out and twisted around until she was straddling him, hands grasping his shoulders tightly. If he wasn't as tough as he was, and was as puny as say a heretic to the grind and all-around squishy type ninja, it would have actually hurt. That is to say, her grip would probably creak the bones of your average genin. Her amazing, audaciously large melons were right in front of his eyes. But despite that, his gaze was locked with Anko's own. Her cheeks were flushed and eyes a little unfocused as she breathed out deeply, and he noticed every moment or so, She'd shiver a bit as if a tingle were constantly running up her spine. Gonna have to be a bit more specific, Daiki replied, raising an eyebrow. I just did what I promised I would. I killed the Petamaru shard inside your seal, he explained. What? She stared at him, eyes looking extra confused with how unfocused they were. But, it's not even been five minutes though? Well, it hadn't even taken him thirty seconds to kill the shard of Orochimaru to be perfectly honest. Not that he blamed it for dying to that. 
It was practically a sitting duck with no warning of what was coming and suddenly had a Jinchuriki cloak enhanced S-class jutsu and full-on Bijidama coming its way. Unless your name was Rinnegan having hacker or you were Hashirama Senju or a Bijou yourself, there wasn't much chance of taking that head on with no warning. I mean I wasn't giving him any chances, I opened up the connection in me and the Sanbai blasted in our most powerful attacks and blew him the hell up, Daiki shrugged. He had no idea it was coming and even if he did, with the amount of chakra he would have had access to, there was nothing he could have done to defend anyway, especially not in a place where he was a sitting duck and had no cover or anywhere to run. Now if only he could get the real Orochimaru in a situation like that. Fun times for everyone, except him, but damn him. Anko just stared at him for a moment. I'm free, she finally muttered, sounded almost disbelieving. But then, what's this feeling going through me and why is my chakra going so crazy? Is it because he's gone? Daiki's brow furrowed. What's up with your chakra? He asked quickly. That didn't sound right at all. Nothing like that happened with him when Isabu ganked the shard that ended up inside him. It's growing rapidly, Anko panted out. Crazily so. It's already increased more than I've gained in the last two years of training. Huh? Oh, that must be because of Isabu passing on the shard's chakra to her like he decided on. But wait, that didn't make sense either. He never ended up like that. Sure, he felt good from it, but that was about it. He didn't look like he was drugged out of his gourd on some kind of lust-enhancing super aphrodisiac drug. Differing circumstances, even if only slightly, Isabu input, while the boost is roughly the same, the difference is your body adapted to constantly growing rapidly in chakra and as such it didn't affect you as much, this woman had a bit less than half the amount of chakra you had before and now has grown by a quarter of her total amount of chakra in the last few minutes after taking years to reach that point. Oh so that was why. Ah, uh, chakra sensing was so useful. Sure he could see chakra if he wanted to, but it was hard to gauge just how much someone had from sight. Sadly he'd never be able to sense chakra that way since he was never born a Sensornin. Sometimes your idiocy astounds me. Isabu sighed. I can sense chakra. Yeah, I know, no need to rub it in mate. Daiki rolled his eyes. Not the time man, he was just about to get his bouncy bouncy fun time on after he dealt with this. I repeat your idiocy astounds me sometimes. He could see in his mind's eyes, the giant turtle bijou rolling his eye. You can use all of my abilities as my jinchuriki should I allow it. And as long as you have my chakra, you will be able to use them, idiot. Ah, uh, neat. Wait, why did you never bring that up before? Like when I was training with my summons? Daiki asked, annoyed. Because it was obvious and I assumed you knew, you were training your physical senses with them, not your ability to sense chakra. Isabu replied, seems I was wrong, honestly. Do you need me to hold your hand for everything? Daiki made the very mature decision to cut off their connection and mute the huge bijou. You realize I can just establish another connection, right? And you can't mute me. Isabu pointed out. Can't hear you. Currently ignoring you. Daiki replied. Isabu cut the connection with a snort. Yeah, he better run. Shaking his head, Daiki put the conversation on the back burner. Mentally adding another form of training to his mental grind list before focusing back on Anko. Ah yeah, that's my fault. The teen told her. A big smirk splaying across his face as he traced one hand up her delightfully full and curvy hip. The chakra from Petamara's shard was still lingering. I could have took it myself, but I gave it to you for a decent increase to your chakra, you're welcome by the way. He felt like a king in this moment. Anko stared at him through half-lidded eyes, before slowly a smirk spread across her own face. You were already getting to clap me as much as you want for dealing with the cursed seal for me. You didn't have to give me anything else, she pointed out. Oh, I know, and I definitely plan on taking advantage of that. Daiki licked his lips eagerly. I just figured a little more chakra would help you keep going for longer, so I don't wear you out too fast, like with Kurinai. So you want to hear me scream about how amazing and big your sausage is, and not just squeal like a pig? Anko asked crudely with a laugh. Something like that, Daiki responded, swallowing heavily in an effort to not just mount her that very second. Though you'll do plenty of squealing, so don't worry about that, he promised. Bet. Her smirk widened, before she swooped down and caught his lips with her own. The next morning, as the dawn came and the sun rose up bit by bit into the sky, found Daiki sitting on the edge of his bed. After having a shower and a quick breakfast, 
Daiki returned to his bedroom to find Anko fast asleep, in the position he left her in. She snored, loudly, very unladylike. Rolling his eyes, the teenager eased her into a laying-down position and pulled the covers over her, before proceeding to get ready and leaving his home behind for the time being. The crisp morning air felt good on his skin and brushing through his hair. Kanoha wasn't exactly cloud or mist temperature-wise, the coldest of the five great villages, but it wasn't exactly sand either, and nearing the latter half of the year now, mornings and days like this would become more common. Daiki couldn't say he disliked it at all, in fact, it reminded him of the place his other self lived. It was a place with a colder climate than average, so crisp mornings were quite common. It's a good day, Daiki mused. The cold air sharpened his senses, which would be good for training with old man Hokage. The cold didn't bother him anyway. He left his home behind and hopped up onto the roof of a nearby building before traveling via roof hopping towards the Hokage Tower. The general populace of the village was just beginning their day, and the hubbub of it all became a gentle backdrop in his ears. It was nice and peaceful, a peace that wouldn't last and would be wholly ruined in the coming years if the Akatsuki, Abito, Madara or Kagaya got their way. It was going to be his job one day, at most a few years away, possibly only a month away, to protect this piece. Despite the fun and enjoyable time he'd had with Anko, a familiar weight seemed to form over his shoulders. Don't worry about it, Isabu spoke up. It's just another weight for you to grind under until you can shoulder it easily, just like any other weight. His lips quirked up. Yeah, you're right. And it wasn't like he was shouldering that weight alone and his big old turtle bro had some real massive shoulders. I mean, if we're being technical, I don't really have shoulders. Isabu pointed out, drawing a snort from the teen. Not long later, he arrived at the Hokage Tower. He spotted the old man right away as he approached. He was standing atop the tower, overlooking the village. Good morning, daiki -kun. The old man greeted him, glancing at the teen from the corner of his eye as he lightly puffed on his pipe. Did you have a good sleep and get well rested for today? Nope, Daiki shrugged. I spent all night having fun with Anko, if you know what I mean old man. Ho? The old man grinned around his pipe. Is that too? You're quite the lucky lad, aren't you? Are you trying to make your sensei jealous? Ha, huh, he was already referring to himself as his sensei. I'm just built different old man. Daiki shrugged and crossed his arms. Speaking of sexy ladies though, how was that old lady Koharu in bed back in the day when she was a hottie? I wouldn't know personally, Sarutobi shrugged. Though I'm told she was quite the minx if Hashirama-sama's words are anything to buy. Daiki blinked. Wait, what? She banged the first? Daiki couldn't help but gape at the old man. Quite a few people did actually, Sarutobi chuckled. Hashirama-sama was a bit of a dog you could say. Many women lusted after him and he indulged quite a bit in it. Damn. The first Hokage was a player? Respect. So I'm not the first one who thought of using the Hokage position to get laid. Daiki realized. Wait, wasn't he married? Yes, yes he was, he was a lucky man indeed. Sarutobi mused with a nod, puffing on his pipe. Mito-sama was quite kinky is the word I believe. Wow, the more you learned man. Mind. Blown. You know, the Uzumaki really do sound crazy sometimes. Daiki shook his head. I wonder how Naruto's mom stacked up. He intentionally dropped. The Sandame side-eyed him thoughtfully. So you even know that? He mused. You realize that's an S-class secret, correct? About as much as Naruto being the QB Jinchuriki. Right? Daiki snorted. Come on. It's not like she's not in the records and closely associated to the Yandame Hokage in them. Always on missions with him and she was the only Uzumaki in the records during that time period, and with Naruto basically being a carbon copy of the Yandame, anyone with a brain could put it together. He had actually confirmed that pretty early on, just for an excuse when he brought this kind of thing up. Kushina Uzumaki wasn't hard at all to find in the records. Her mission count, her ninja registration number, etc. It was all there at the Shinobi Library. You'd be surprised how few have made the connection actually, Sarutobi pointed out. As for Kushina herself, she was something all right, that was for sure. That's for sure, Daiki agreed. The Yandame was a lucky guy. Given a chance I'd be all over that red-headed babe. Never tell Naruto that, Sarutobi responded dryly. 
Hey man, if Naruto was a chick, I'd be all over her too, Daiki shrugged. As a girl, Naruto is a hottie hot hottie. Gotta be them Uzumaki jeans man. Probably the real reason why those ugly dudes from Cloud and Stone teamed up to wipe them out. Then I'm sure we can all be glad Naruto is a boy then, the old man snorted. The last thing we need is an angry female Jinchuriki because she caught the boy she likes hitting on other girls like you do. Well, he wasn't wrong. When the joking conversation died down, Haruzen turned to Daiki. Are you ready? He asked. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't old man. Daiki responded, smirk fading as his lips pressed into a thin line. Serious mode going into effect. Good, because we don't have a whole lot of time. Haruzen nodded. I won't be going easy on you at all, he said, placing his hand on Daiki's shoulder. And it was then the boy noticed. His pipe was gone. He hadn't noticed. When did he? That thought didn't get much time to process as the old man's chakra enveloped him and he was brought along via Shunshin. Fast, Daiki noticed. He could barely keep track of their surroundings as the old man transported him along with the jutsu. Even with his heavenly star seal and three-tailed cloak together, he'd be hard-pressed to keep up. It would be another thing if he could use lightning chakra mode reliably with them in his physical body, but that was currently impossible for him. Moments later, it ended, and Daiki noticed that they were standing atop the Hokage Monument. Why are we dash? Daiki began asking, looking around. But he never got to finish his question as the elderly Hokage brought his hands together into a single seal and the ground rumbled beneath their feet. Daiki blinked and stared as the ground rumbled and part of it began to slide away, revealing a staircase that led into the mountain itself. What the? The teen gave the old man an odd look. How was that there? He'd looked at the mountain plenty of times with his shink again. It was pretty hard not to seeing how big it was. But he'd never saw anything like this. At his baffled look, Haruzen gave him a light grin. I see there are things even you haven't been able to see even with those eyes of yours. He noted, knowingly. His tone implied he knew why he hadn't seen it before either. The old man gestured for him to follow him down into the stairs. And Daiki did so. The opening sliding shut once more as Sarutobi made the same hand seal he did previously once they were both inside. For a moment, they were both in pitch black darkness, before everything lit up. Glowing blue lights traveling down the walls on either side of the staircase, lighting the area up. What is this place? Daiki asked as the old man began walking down the stairs and followed behind him. I should think that would be quite obvious consider what you're here for, the Hokage chuckled. But to clarify and speed things up, the Hokage needs somewhere private to train as well, to not become rusty, to become stronger and keep up appearances all in one. Getting stronger and not getting rusty, he could understand that. But the other, not so much, keep up appearances? He asked. Hmm. Saratobi looked over his shoulder at Daiki and gave him an almost mischievous look. I'll give you a hint. When the tree leaves dance, one shall find flames. The fire's shadow will illuminate the village. A poem or a haiku? Honestly, he wasn't very well versed in either, so he couldn't tell. But he'd heard those words before from the very same man in another life. As he died. And he was using it as a riddle for him? A test? Seriously? Daiki gave him a deadpan gaze. Sartobi chuckled again. I'm sure it sounds like hogwash to a young man like yourself, but there is great meaning in this phrase, and in fact, it's only half of it, he replied. It is a saying created by Hashirama-sama himself and is passed down from Hokage to their chosen successors. Wait, what? But didn't he say it to Orochimaru as he died? No, wait. Or was he just thinking it? It was hard to remember that part, especially clearly to remember if it was talking aloud or thought. Well, whatever. Fine. I'll play your game, old man. Daiki rolled his eyes. The leaf finding fire is obviously the one that is going to become Hokage. And the Hokage is the one that illuminates the village, so I guess a beacon everyone is drawn to and gathers around? Or use that light to lead them or something? Yes, that's correct. The old man nodded proudly. Why though? It wasn't exactly some hard riddle, it was pretty straightforward. For reference, the full quote is, When the tree leaves dance, one shall find flames. The fire's shadow will illuminate the village, and once again, 
Tree leaves shall bud anew. The older man revealed. You were near spot on, only missing one thing. The Hokage is also the pillar that supports the village. Their strength and leadership must be seen as infallible. And inspire the belief that as long we are here, there is no greater defender for them and their loved ones. Daiki stared blankly at the man's back for a moment, pondering those words before it clicked for him. This place is super private so nobody can possibly see any mistakes the Hokage make when training, he realized. It's so nobody can see that the Hokage isn't actually infallible and invincible. That is correct, Daiki Kuen. Saratobi paused and looked back at him with a warm, beaming smile on his elderly face. We are strong, yes, but we are not gods. Yet, we must cultivate such an image when it comes to strength, to provide the support the new leaves need to bud and flourish to their greatest heights. That is what it means to be Hokage, the fire shadow that illuminates the leaf village. It is to be the pillar that supports the village and the undefeatable sentinel that will guard the village against any and all opponents even if it costs our lives. Daiki fell silent at the man's words, and from there, followed him down deeper into the Hokage mountain without a word. He was thinking on the man's words. He understood it all and the point and even why it was necessary. But it was just so contradictory. Take the Yandame Hokage for instance. Namike's Minato was an incredible shinobi and powerful beyond words. People treated him like he really was a god and spoke of him in awe to this day over a decade since his death. But he wasn't invincible. He wasn't even close to infallible. He was freaking dead after all and left his only son to fend for himself. Yet, people acted as if him actually dying didn't detract from that all. Hell, even in the academy not even a year ago, there were girls in his clash gushing over pictures of him and wanting to marry him. When he was dead, humans as a whole are a contradictory species. Isabu mused, piping in. You speak of love and peace, yet readily wage war and commit atrocities in the same breath. You look down up murderers and thieves, yet have made a profession out of them that dominates the world. You yourself are terrified and find yourself lacking in too many ways to count, but brag and boast louder than anyone else of your greatness. Daiki grimaced. He couldn't even think of anything to say in response that. After all, that was the ugliest part of being human, and the ugliest part who he was. His very identity was an illusion that he made himself believe in. And to be Hokage, it seemed, was to make that illusion your reality. When he thought about it like that, maybe Naruto wasn't wrong at any point in his path at all. The blonde constantly lied to himself and lived an illusion, buried his rage, despair and hatred into a deep dark corner, and hid it away from anyone and everyone. The only one who knew the true Naruto for the longest time was Kurama. Just like only I know the true Daiki, Isabu added with a wistful sigh. Kind of ironic when you think about it. Considering you're practically the direct opposite of him and well, I am the polite sibling as I've said multiple times now, while Kurama is the most violent, rude and gruff among us, but also the most damaged. Daiki wasn't sure how to reply to that. You don't need to, Isabu pointed out. That's your biggest problem Daiki and the biggest source of stress in your life you always think you need something to respond with or a counter. Sometimes, the best course of action is to say or do nothing at all. Daiki opened his mouth, before pausing. If he replied, he would just prove his point. Not what I meant at all, Isabu sighed. But baby steps, I suppose. He didn't get much time to ponder on the bijou's words. Because finally, after minutes of walking down the stairway, they reached the bottom. It opened up into a large cavern area. And by large, he meant massive, it had to span the length and width of the entire mountain. And it wasn't exactly empty either. There were rows upon rows of weapons from swords to maces, to even staves lining the cavern walls, huge training posts at one side of the huge area. And at the far end of the room he could see what looked to be a massive pond, with a huge tree growing up out of it. And behind it, he could see a door leading in to some other area. Honestly, how the hell had he not noticed something this massive underneath the mountain? It was as he looked around the room though, he noticed it. Familiar scrawls of ink over the walls. Seals. He couldn't recognize most of the patterns, but some of it was similar to a few things he knew. Specifically, barrier seals? He muttered aloud. That's right, Daiki Kuin. Saratobi nodded. This is the personal training area for the Hokage? 
It was created by Hashira Masama with the help of his wife Mito-sama. Ah, uh, that explained it. Playboy Kage and his kinky Uzumaki wife. This was definitely something he could see coming from them. And it explained the stupid huge tree growing out of the underground pond as well. Where there was no sunlight, yet it looked healthier than most trees he saw outside the village. This Daikikuen is where we'll be spending our time training over the next eight days. Sartobi gestured to the wide expanse of the training cavern. I will of course not be able to spend all my time here with you, and will have to often leave to take care of my duties, but for the next eight days you will not be leaving this area. Well, good thing he had already planned ahead for that kind of thing, even if it was actually going to be longer than he thought. His Dimension 4 seal was always stacked with food that would keep for a while just in case he went on a training binge after all. Though it did bring up the actual questions, what if he hadn't been prepared already? What about eating or pissing for that matter? The genin asked. In response the old man gestured to the door behind the pond. That area behind that door is a small living space it has everything you'd need. The older man replied. There is a bed, basic medical supplies, food, and of course a toilet with plumbing. There was plumbing down here? How? Daiki asked, raising an eyebrow at the man. Few in Jutsu. How else my boy? Sartobi laughed, and then placed his right hand on his chest and his left hand on his left leg. Speaking of seals though, I believe it is time we get down to business, no? As he said that, his Hokage robes shifted and disappeared, leaving him clad in nothing but a familiar full black outfit. The Hokage hat disappearing the same way a second later and being replaced by a black hooded helmet. Daiki blinked. Wait! Huh? He gaped. I must admit, your storage seal is very useful. The old man mused with a grin. This guy stole his jutsu. Well really, it was just an augmented storage seal really. But come on that was his thing. Why you? You Uchiha. Daiki spluttered. Such was his surprise. I mean, how many jutsu have you stole from others? Isabu pointed out dryly. Pot meat kettle, you're both black. Sartobi chuckled lightly at Daiki's insult. Now now Daiki Kuin, your Toborama sensei is showing. What would Sasuke Kuin think? He wagged his finger at him. Besides, once you get to a certain point, it becomes rather easy to copy jutsu even without the Sharingan. Wait, what? Daiki blinked. His slight shock overseeing his own seal being used by somebody else dissipating. Like he had copied Jutsu before but it was different for him while he didn't have the Sharingan he could full on look into people's memories if needed and of course see their chakra and watch how they molded it. But it wasn't something that let him copy Jutsu instantly or anything. It took long years of training and effort on my part but for many Jutsu I can recreate them just from sight alone these days. The old man grinned lightly. For instance... The old man brought up both hands with one he just held up his palm, while the other he made. One-handed seals? Daiki's eyes about bugged out of his head at the sheer casualness of it. And he was lucky they didn't pop right out of his skull by what happened next. First, there was a whirring noise as blue energy formed in the old man's palm, forming into a violently rotating sphere of chakra. While in the other, lightning shrieked into existence like a thousand shrieking birds, coating his entire arm. This in my left hand is the Raisingan, the signature technique and original jutsu of the Yandame Hokage, while in my right is the Chidori, a technique created by your good friend Kakashikuin in his youth. Sarutobi explained nonchalantly. Hacks. Daiki called hacks. You're trying to say you recreated those jutsu just from seeing them? Daiki asked disbelievingly. Indeed I am, I had no need to be taught them, it is simply that I have so much experience and know so much jutsu and ways of manipulating my chakra, that it becomes child's play to recreate jutsu such as these, jinjutsu are harder for instance but possible, the old man continued on, though I'm of course not unique in this aspect and in fact, I dare say I know of at least one other that has much greater talent than even myself when it comes to this kind of thing. You're kidding right? Who the hell is this monster then? Daiki asked because he'd love to have them at his back when things got hairy later down the road. Oh, I think you know of him quite well. Sarutobi's smile turned sobering. It was a slight change. But Daiki's enhanced perception from his eyes allowed him to notice it. It was a smile that wasn't happy at all, but rather, almost sorrowful. After all, your dear friend Sasuke Kuen has made it no secret what his goal in life is. Daiki froze. Itachi Uchiha? Correct? 
the Hokage nodded. He was capable of such feats from a young age, without his Sharingan or even much training. The first time he was shown the Grand Fireball Jutsu when he was five years old, he copied it instantly and made an even more powerful one than his father, an elite jonin and one of the stronger ninja within our village at the time had. Wait, that sounded familiar. That was... in Itachi's filler backstory, right? Which was supposed to be getting a novel or something. Such a shame how things turned out, Hiruzen sighed. He was perhaps the greatest prodigy that originated from this village, or at least close to it and could have rivaled the Yandame given time, perhaps even surpassed him and all the Hokage that came before. Surpassed the Hokage that came before. Daiki mulled over those words, filing the prodigy crap about Itachi in the back of his mind. He already knew the dude was an utter monster. Was Itachi a Hokage candidate? He wondered. Haruzen sighed. Perhaps I should explain. He mused and gave Daiki a slight smile. There is much blame to be held over young Itachi's actions. Some I lay at my own feet even, and wish that I had not allowed others to dictate his path. You could say my prompt action with snatching you up myself comes from my mistakes with Itachi. What? Daiki would admit it, he was lost. To be frank, yes, Itachi was a Hokage candidate. Hiruzen revealed, dropping quite the bomb. Itachi was the perfect shinobi, he was diligent, intelligent, could suppress his emotions for the mission and the good of the village, a genius among geniuses and of course incredibly powerful even at such a young age. I thought to allow him more experience and allowed others such as Danzo to foster his growth in the Umbu. That was a mistake. I mean, Danzo himself is pretty much a mistake. Daiki snorted mentally, but didn't interrupt the old man. And above all else, Itachi knew what it meant to be Hokage. Haruzen sighed and shook his head. If only I had taken him as an apprentice myself instead of allowing Danzo to oversee things, I may have been able to prevent the tragedy of the Uchiha. For a moment, Hiruzen truly did look his age. A tired old man. But, it only lasted a split moment before he controlled his emotions once more. He was a pinnacle shinobi after all. He could probably shed a tear and wipe it away before Daiki even noticed. Though, perhaps not, he frowned. Thanks to you and the information you brought back upon becoming a Jinchuriki, things are beginning to fall into place and holes and mysteries I never found the answers to have suddenly been filled. Did he mean the whole thing about Abido pretending to be Madara and hypnotizing Yagura? Well, actually now that he thought about it, one of the biggest things about the Uchiha massacre was what led to them attempting their coup. Being ostracized by the village because it was suspected an Uchiha was behind the Kubi attack. Which was correct, everyone was just looking at it from the wrong angle. It was an Uchiha, just one that had a massive grudge against his clan. The Uchiha massacre might have been ordered by the Hokage and elders, but the true blame lay at Abido and Madara's feet. They instigated it all. Granted, Danzo was an idiot about it as well, so he should get a lot of the blame as well. Even if Shursue's idea to brainwash the entire clan was kind of a stupid idea as well now that Daiki thought about it. It was only a stopgap after all. Madara's hatred of his own clan is etched into history itself these days. Even I have heard of it, Isabu mused. Assuming the Hokage believes it to be Madara, or Madara's successor which would be an obvious thought, then that would answer the mysteries of that night and what led to the Uchiha being ostracized. That did make sense, and was very convenient for Daiki. The old man had fallen silent, and didn't say anything else for a few moments. And so being in Umbu from a young age made him snap, right? Daiki asked, offering him an olive branch. The old man clearly didn't want to reveal the truth behind the Uchiha massacre right now. If ever. To be honest, Daiki thought the truth of it was better off buried right now. It really was just a whole crap shot that made the entire clan look pretty pathetic from every angle. The only ones who came out of it looking good were Shursue and Itachi. That is the the top theory, yes? Haruzen nodded and gave a sigh before sobering up. Which is why I thought it best to take a more hands-on approach with you myself. Not like I planned on being Umbu anyway. Daiki snorted with a shrug. The armor and gear is pretty sweet, but the whole silent secretive stuff isn't my thing. I like to brag about my exploits. Loudly. For everyone to hear and praise me for the amazing badass I am. Quite. Haruzen chortled. It's much better to have a Hokage candidate in the spotlight for the most part anyway. Your image and exploits gather awe and intrigue from the village. 
and reinforces their faith in you when you ascend to the position. That made sense. I should probably let everyone know what I've been up to then. Daiki nodded. He would have to brag more, he supposed, in public. Sure was hard being him. No need. I have already circulated your exploits through the village. Haruzen gave him a knowing grin. I sent some trusted Jonin out to gossip about your exploits from defeating a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, to foiling a plot using a bijou and even fighting off my former student, an S-rank shinobi. I dare say your legend has already began. Ah, how sneaky. Daiki wasn't expecting that at all, but it showed how on the ball the old man was with his decision here. He was already laying the groundwork for the village as a whole to look at him in awe. Just what you need. A whole village of hype men. Isabu groaned. The epic of Daiki. The teen Genin mused, a smirk forming on his face. That has a nice ring to it. Gilgamesh is going to sue you with lots and lots of swords. He wishes. I could totally kick his ass. Daiki refuted. He'd see how Gilgamesh liked getting sword barraged right back. He couldn't even beat a ginger with a hero-slash-martyr complex. He'd bijudama his butt out of existence before he ever got the chance to pull out his trump card. Perhaps you should write a book, you may even be successful enough not to need to write pornography like a certain other student of mine. Haruzen mused with another light chortle before clenching his fists and allowing the jutsu in his hands that Daiki had almost forgot about to be quashed out of existence and stretched his arms. Though for now Daiki Kuin, I believe it is time to as you kids say, get down to business. Daiki's smirk transitioned into a wide eager grin. Finally old man, as much as the information is good to know, this is what I'm here for. He cheered, cracking his knuckles, and then his neck for good measure. He only had eight days to train with the old man right now. So he needed to make every second count. For these eight days, he would have to transcend the grind itself and enter the legendary hypergrind. Where do you come up with this stuff? Isabu asked, deadpan. I had a lot of time to think while screwing Anko, Daiki responded. Come on, you can't think I'd waste all that time with just cheeks clapping, right? Amazing as it is, my mind wandered. He could feel Isabu rolling his eyes in exasperation. Good to see you're ready then. Haruzen smiled back and after stretching out, stood normally, unguarded and out of any stance. I believe we'll start simple. I wish to see your current limit without boosting over your base abilities. No seal. No augment jutsu like my lightning armor. No bijou cloaks, alright, simple enough I gotcha. Daiki nodded in understand, slipping into the opening stance for the feather fist style. Both arms up, fists clenched, one at the side of his head while the other was slightly ahead of his face, and one leg pulled slightly back. The feather fist style, truly a fitting taijutsu for you, fast with explosive concentrated strikes. I applaud your choice in it. The old man nodded approvingly. Now let us begin. Come at me with the intent to kill Daiki Kuen. Only then will I see your true abilities. You don't have to tell me twice. Daiki laughed. Not even at all bothered about the older man not entering his fighting stance. He slid his foot back further to push off with. At the same time he made a single hand seal and exploded forward in a rush towards the old man with a Shunshin enhanced blitz. His eyes with their enhanced perception were digging into the old man's form preparing for any move he could make from the slightest twitches of his muscles as he rushed forward lashing out with a rapid right straight aiming for his face, specifically his eyes, to cut off his vision. It was a feint after all. At the same time he lashed out with his fist, never intending to make contact with it. He swung his foot out in a stomping kick towards the old man's knee. He'd smash his kneecap and limit his movements massively with it. He never made contact. Hiruzen clasped his hands behind his back and didn't even flinch at his fist. At the same time, the old man lifted the leg he was aiming for up, avoiding his blow and before Daiki could backtrack from his failed strike. The old man's leg moved like a serpent, coming down over his thigh and catching it beneath his knee, pinning his leg there and keeping him off balance. The ability to predict your opponent's movements from the slightest twitch of their muscles with your eyes is indeed a very useful and potent ability. The old man Hokage began lecturing straight away. But, it is not undefeatable. The Sharingan can do that as well, and how many Uchiha have been killed despite that ability? A better variation in their case, in fact. Try not to rely on that ability too much when it comes to close combat Daikiken. Though I must admit, 
Very impressive speed for your age. Daiki grinned at him. Sure. But you realize even if you caught me, you're stuck too. He retorted and pushed off with his other leg, rising into a knee strike aimed for his new teacher's chin. Once again, it didn't make contact. The old man's hand came from behind his back, quick as a flash and his palm stopped Daiki's strike in its tracks. But it did its job and loosened the grip his leg had on his own and Daiki thrust his left palm out to the side, using his force palm jutsu to increase his momentum and rip his leg free, not bothering to aim for the man since he'd see it coming a mile away and retreat. Leg coming free, Daiki spun midair like a rapidly rotating spinning top and lashed out with a dragon will kick aimed at the man's neck. Daiki's eyes widened though when the old man casually bent forward, ducking under the blow before both hands whipped up and caught his ankle. Sure dash! Daiki never even got to finish his curse before the old man stopped him in his tracks with his grip and reared back up, lifting Daiki up above his head, before promptly smashing him into the ground. The ground shattered from the sheer force of the blow, and if Daiki weren't so tough, he would have had the wind knocked out of his lungs. As it was, he was still stunned and not able to counter as the old man reared him back up into the air before spinning like a tornado and letting go, launching him like a bullet. He smashed into the cavern wall multiple dozens of feet away like a wrecking ball and went straight into it, debris falling and creating a cloud as his body cratered into it from the sheer strength behind the toss. Okay that hurt. Daiki groaned, shaking his head and pushing himself up. Before the smoke and debris could clear though, he thrust both hands behind him and jumped, unleashing a pair of force palms that launched him high and rapidly into the air towards Haruzen's position. Then he launched another pair of force palms propelling him downwards and generating even more force and momentum. He smashed down with a double hammer blow that the old man sprang nimbly back from, the ground shattering inwards from the force of his blow, but Daiki didn't pause and rush the old man, launching into a flurry of rapid-fire blows, leading with punches into kicks, enhancing his momentum and rapidly rotating to hide his next move and gain more momentum for his next flurry of blows. He was pure non-stop motion given form. Yet the old man dodged, weaved around or parried and blocked his flurry of attacks with little effort, letting Daiki tire himself out a bit, or maybe just to see how long he could keep up such a flurry of connected and concentrated attacks. The answer was, he could keep it going for a pretty damn long time his stamina was insane and recovered rapidly even in his base. And the old man realized that pretty quickly, because he shut him down not long later and went on the offensive. Beautiful in its simplicity and timing at least. With no wasted movements and nothing Daiki could predict or at the very least keep up with in his base form speed, the old man weaved to the right avoiding a knee strike aimed at his ribs, before sliding back left, foot extended and catching his ankle. The old man barely touched him and he turned all of Daiki's momentum against him as the tan genin found himself carried into midair, sideways and with little reach to counter. And then the Hokage smiled at him warmly and lashed out with a palm strike that caught him in the center of his stomach. Force palm jutsu. The old man announced gently. Daiki's eyes widened in shock. And then he gagged as a very familiar burst of pressure slammed into and through his stomach and carried him back through the air a good twenty feet where he landed on his back, gagging and wheezing. Hell! Daiki spluttered inwardly as he gagged. Blood erupting from his mouth as he hacked and coughed. He'd never been properly hit by his own jutsu. It sure was something. If it weren't for his durability, endurance and natural healing ability, that would have been debilitating and kept him down for at least a little bit. A point-blank shock wave to the internal organs would do that to a guy. Actually, most people would be dead. As many of his opponents could attest to, if they weren't dead from being hit by the force palm. He sure could make a jutsu, couldn't he? But this was no time to be patting himself on the back. One arm wrapped around his stomach to keep his organs from jostling any while he healed. Daiki clawed his way to his knees and glared at the old man, baring his blood-stained teeth at him. Another? One of my jutsu old man? He growled. You sure you don't have them spinny red monkey balls? Haruzen just laughed. They're more one in the same those jutsu of yours. And well, I don't know about spinning in red, but I dare say I have quite the supply of monkey balls. He replied in amusement. Though, I suppose it's only fair I show off one of my own jutsu in return to Daikikuen? Despite how soft, gentle and warm the smile that was on the older man's face was, it sent alarm bells ringing off in Daiki's head. 
especially when the Hokage made a single hand seal, with a single hand and breathed in deep, his chest expanding and flames spilling from between his lips, fire style, fire dragon missile, and then promptly exhaled and fired off a gargantuan serpentine flaming dragon that blocked out his vision of the old man with its sheer bulk and roared towards him. Holy hell! Daiki gaped. The old man was seriously not pulling his punches. This would be a really good time to put the fire sealing method to test. If he actually knew the fire sealing method. But no matter how many clones he had raided the texts the village shinobi library had on sealing, none of them even mentioned it. And he definitely needed it for the future to deal with Amaterasu just in case. It was too big and fast to dodge or outright with him injured right now and countering with the same amount of power would leave him in point-black range for the clash. He could only block. He ran through a few hand seals as he surged to his feet, and his chest expanded just like the old man's as he pumped a metric ton of chakra into his jutsu and exhaled. Water-style, water wall. He spat a massive rushing wave of water that formed up into a huge shield over 30 feet high and long, just in time for the massive fire dragon to smash into the barrier of water. An explosion erupted and shook the training cavern as steams welled outwards from the clash. He felt his skin drying up from the sheer heat produced and his mouth dry up. But, at the very least, he could use the vapor in the steam for his own benefit as well. He rapidly ran through hand seals as the dragon finally puttered out, leaving him enveloped in steam and his now limp and falling apart water barrier, spreading his chakra out. As he did, the steam converged into the barrier and the amount of water once again swelled up, before twisting and forming into into a familiar, if very different serpentine form and clearing his vision to show the old man still in his previous position. Water style, water dragon jutsu. His own dragon of water roared and shot in the opposite direction of the fire dragon, towards the old man, deadly intent in its gleaming yellow eyes. But Daiki wasn't done. He rapidly made another few hand seals before thrusting his hands out. Lightning style, electromagnetic murder, he roared, unleashing a stream of crackling, branching electricity from his hands that shot over and enveloped his water dragon. Ho ho, a combination jutsu I see? Haruzan nodded, pleased. I'm impressed. He hadn't seen anything yet. As the dragon rushed him, so too did Daiki, pumping chakra into his eyes all the way. For the first time, he bore witness to the old man losing his composure, however minutely as tens of dozens of clones formed all around him in Daiki, all rushing him like the dragon. However experienced he was, there were some things that just weren't possible. And the Chakra Ghost clones couldn't be told apart from him, they made sound as they moved and even the Byakugan and Sharingan couldn't tell them apart from the real thing. The old man was forced to actually properly backpedal and dodge for the first time, leaping backwards and dodging his Chakra Ghost clones as they came at him from all sides with the electricity-enhanced water dragon hot on their heels. The old man ran through blurring hand seals Daiki's eyes couldn't keep up with and as he landed, he finished. At the same time a puff of smoke came from one of his hands and a massive Fuma Shuriken appeared in his grip. Wind whistled, forming around the edges of the Fuma Shuriken and the old man tossed it through the air. The spiraling star looking like a rapid buzzsaw Shuriken Shadow Clone Jutsu. One giant Fuma Shuriken became dozens, then hundreds in the blink of an eye. And in just seconds, most of his clones and his huge electrified water dragon were torn asunder. Even he wouldn't have been able to avoid them and gotten caught up in the barrage of wind enhanced Fuma Shuriken. If not for him creating a barrier of chakra and funneling a ton of his chakra into it, it stopped dozens of those clone Shuriken in their tracks and forced them to dispel. Would have been easier if he used his armor, but the old man wanted to see him fight with his own base abilities. As it was, as he dispelled the chakra barrier, Daiki even with his own endurance and massive chakra capacity found himself panting deeply. Both from the damage he'd taken and the rather large amount of chakra he'd just expended in short order. Meanwhile the old man looked no worse for wear at all. In fact, his clothing wasn't even ruffled and he still had that genial smile on his face. He wasn't gonna lie, it was kind of annoying. I think I've seen enough for now, Hiruzen mused, clapping his hands promptly. You can relax Daikikuen, despite himself and the way that casual dismissal hurt his pride in his abilities. 
Daiki couldn't help but feel relief. God damn, that old man was a monster. He didn't even come close to him in his base. So this was what the professor and second god of Shinobi was made of, huh? Daiki had to admit he lived up to the hype. I know exactly what we'll be working on for the next week or say Daiki Kuen. The old man said as he casually walked over towards him at a leisurely pace. Though tell me, if I were to give you a choice of jutsu, what would you prefer? An elemental jutsu? A normal ninja art? A taijutsu technique? Or perhaps even a genjutsu? Daiki blinked. You're going to teach me jutsu? He asked. All injuries and exhaustion becoming quickly forgotten as excitement jumped in his veins. Among other things, Hiruzen replied. There are a few specific jutsu I must teach you if you were to become Hokage in the future. Jutsu only the Hokage themselves learn. But variety is the spice of life and a big help in different situations. So I'll be teaching you a variety of jutsu beyond them as well. Hokage only jutsu? That sounded freaking badass. Beyond them though, what did he need? He had lots of normal jutsu, quite a few genjutsu at this point, and even tons of elemental jutsu. Though, ironically the one he was most lacking in was for his main elemental affinity, lightning. Well, technically it was fire jutsu since he only knew the one, but he'd been training lightning by far the longest and only had three pure lightning jutsu. And that was including his lightning armor. Wow, he really needed some more lightning jutsu. I need lightning jutsu more than any else at the moment, Daiki replied, followed by fire. I'd prefer lightning over fire though since I've not done any fire elemental training yet. I see. Hiruzen stroked his chin and hummed in thought for a moment, before nodding, easily rectified. I will get you a scroll on fire elemental training, and I believe we'll star you off on learning the lightning style. Thunderbomb, I believe it will go very well with your Kiba blades. All right. Daiki nodded, grinning. It was kind of weird actually having a sensei who would teach him something, he wasn't gonna lie. Kakashi, Kurinai, and Asuma hadn't taught their teams anything after all. What am I? Chopped liver? Isabu huffed. You're not a sensei, you're my Isobro. Daiki refuted. That disqualified him from the inherent failure that was senseis if those three clowns were anything to go by. Once you master that jutsu, I will provide you with another, one a day assuming you can master them in that day, if not, you'll just have more of a backlog I'm sure. The old man chuckled, breaking him from his internal debate. For now though, I will be returning to my office and leaving you with a clone of mine to oversee your training. As he said that, he made a single hand seal and summoned a shadow clone to his side. I hope that recovery ability of yours from becoming a Jinchuriki is good to keep you going Daiki Kuen. The clone gave him that warm, gentle, terrifying smile, because we don't have much time and we're getting right down to it right now. You know, looking at that smile, Daiki was so, so glad he got his hands on that fragment of jello to boost his recovery and healing ability alongside his Jinchuriki crap. Old man Saratobi was a beast. Despite how genial and kind the elder Hokage was, that was not at all present during Daiki's training with him. He was given little time to rest and he was drilled from sun up to sun down and beyond. Taijutsu drills until his limbs ached. Multiple chakra control exercises at once. A new jutsu to learn every single day. And that was just the early morning practice. From there, they would move on to taijutsu sparring, atop the walls, atop the ceiling, atop the pond within the huge cavernous training room itself. Daiki was given no quarter and no mercy at all. He would fight the old man with pure taijutsu and get his absolute crap kicked in. Sarutobi Haruzen's personal taijutsu styles were the monkey fist, a style his clan learned from the monkey summons, and the drunken monkey, a style he created personally based on that. But that was not all he used. The academy style, the Inazuka's beast claw style, the Uchiha's interceptor style, the strong fist, the Hyuga's gentle fist, even his own feather fist style and more beyond, taijutsu styles belonging to other villages. The old man slipped between so many different fighting styles, that after five days Daiki had long since lost count. From there, he would be given a half an hour break to eat and recover, before being thrown right back into it with running through drills of the jutsu he already knew and what he was in the process of learning. And then they would spar again with everything at their disposal. Daiki's at least. Because the old man never once used a jutsu Daiki didn't already know, had seen already or was in the process of learning. And each time, even while they fought, the man would coach him, pointing out his mistakes, 
give him advice on what he was working on while at the same time beating him black and blue. Even with his heavenly star seal, even when drawing upon the lightning chakra mode, Daiki never once managed to defeat a single one of the man's shadow clones. And he sent quite a few to train him when he was busy each day. Especially since the last thing on the agenda each night was to spar with five of his shadow clones at once, each one using a different fighting style. He lost horribly, each and every single time, and Daiki loved every second of it. Never had he been so beaten, never had he felt so exhausted in all his life, never before had anyone pushed him to his limits and beyond as much as Sarutobi Haruzen. Even with his regeneration and Jinchuriki status, by time the sixth morning of training under the third Hokage rolled around and Daiki was roused awake in the morning after being literally beat unconscious. His mind was heavy, his body aching with phantom pains from multiple dozens if not hundreds of wounds that had long since healed. Ugh! Daiki rolled over in the rather luxurious, soft king-size bed that was present in the living area provided within the training cavern under the Hokage Monument, before pushing himself up and out of the bed a moment later. He had only just awoken, but he couldn't afford to waste any time of his time at all training under the old man. He washed in the bathroom to wake himself up, summoned new clothes from his Dimension Force seal, ate a quick, crappy metal and made his way out into the main training hall. As he did, he called idly upon his status to check out his progress. Name, Daiki Yuri. Age 13. Chakra Capacity. 192. 700 slash 192. 700. Low Tier Kage. Strength. 204. Endurance. 290. Durability. 205. Agility. 204. Taijutsu. 260 slash 500 ninjutsu, 380 slash 500 jinjutsu, 105 slash 500 bukajutsu, 180 slash 500, chakra control, 317 slash 500, chakra affinities, lightning, expert the heaven spark, water, expert the sea parts before you, wind, master the gale bows, earth, adept the earth shakes, fire, Novice simmering power Fuinjutsu, advanced the breath hitches. Damn! He whistled, impressed in spite of himself. The progress he'd made in the last five days had been nothing short of explosive. Even for him, everything had risen by more than 25 points skill-wise, his Taijutsu had outright risen a full 50 and his Jinjutsu, even while not learning any new ones, had risen dramatically from how much he'd been forced to use it to even stave the old man off for even a second more during the spars they had. And beyond that, not only had his lightning affinity risen up to the expert level, he'd outright hit the mastery point of the wind element. Alongside earth and fire appearing on his status as affinities now. It was kind of ironic that he'd mastered the outright worst element polar opposite of his first affinity before any else. Well, it's not like I've actually been training my lightning affinity all that much lately. He mused. The increase in ability had risen from advanced to expert simply because each day, the old man Hokage would give him a new lightning jutsu to learn and expected him to get them down before he got another more or less. Honestly, it would have been outright impossible without all his shadow clones training diligently within Isabu's dimension. But it was amazing either way because he now had an affinity for every single element. A moment later, he dismissed the status screen as he opened the door of the living space and left, entering the training space. He was not at all surprised to find a familiar old man dressed in his battle gear, casually sitting on a comfortable armchair that looked completely out of place in the training area, nursing a cup of tea. Good morning, Daiki Kuen. Haruzen greeted him warmly. You took a whole minute longer to come today, I was almost afraid you were going to boycott training today. He was teasing, but Daiki snorted anyway. If it wasn't for Isabu, I might have, he shrugged. Like he could not stress enough, the old man and his clones literally beat him unconscious every night. Even with his absurd vitality and healing, it usually took time to wake up normally from that and Isabu forced him to stay unconscious and rest his mind as long as possible on top of that. Honestly, it's no wonder the Sanin turned out to be complete monsters if this is how you train your students. He'd only been at it five days and increased his ability to affinities, gained two new ones, rose up a rank with one and learned literally over ten jutsu. Five lightning, two earth, one wind. 
The old man's fire style. Fire dragon missile jutsu with coaching from him. Hell, the old man had even known the poison mist jutsu and helped him get it down in that time as well in between kicking his butt up and down the cavern. Sadly, he hadn't managed to get that equipment shadow clones jutsu down yet though. But yeah, the Sanin trained under old man Sarutobi for years. They would have either become complete monsters under him or died in the process. Honestly, the older generation of ninja were made of some real tough nails back in the day. He was barely managing to keep going even with his healing abilities. Haruzen who was about to raise his cup up to his lips paused and laughed lightly. Oh Daikikuen, I'm afraid I didn't train them even closely to as intense as I'm training you. Unlike them, we only have a week together for the moment. His eyes twinkled with amusement. In fact, I was not even planning on training you this hard, but I was forced to escalate because of how quickly you have been progressing and just the sheer amount of endurance you have. If I trained my old students as I did you, I don't think they would have survived long. Ha! Huh. Daiki blinked, surprised. No, what is there to be surprised about? While they are indeed incredibly powerful and talented, two of them are from civilian backgrounds. Isabu deadpanned, making himself known for the first time in the day. You have me, a literal bijou and everything going on in that seal of yours on your neck enhancing you, healing you, filling you with energy. Any other human would have long since died from the sheer amount of energy you have exuded in the last few days and if not that, just the sheer amount of injuries would have did. Sure, but it was still surprising. But, it was good news at least, it showed he truly was on the right path. Or maybe he was delirious from one too many head wounds from being beaten unconscious from an utter monster of an old man. Eh, you've been 51 cards shot of a deck since the moment I met you. Isabu helpfully replied. Daiki smirked and shrugged off the jibe, turning his attention back to the old man. Good to know I'm the most badass student you've ever had. He replied. So... What's on the menu for today? Same as usual? He questioned, excitement once again filling him at the thought. Truly, these five days had been a grind paradise. Honestly, the only bad thing he had to say about it was that it sucked he hadn't finished his seal to integrate Shursue's Sharingan. If he did, he'd have been able to copy literally every prolific taijutsu style the Leaf Village had to offer from the old man during their spars. Actually, we're going to be doing something a little different today. Haruzen shook his head. I was initially going to hold off on this until after the Chunin exams when I would have more time to teach you, but after what I've seen of you the past five days, I believe you may be able to get it down in these last two days. Huh? Well that sucked, he was all for getting more lightning jutsu from the man. With each one he learned after all, he felt his control over the element increase noticeably. Though that might just have to do with the fact the old man had not taught him a single low-level technique. Four of them had been B-rank, while the most powerful of them all, the lightning style, Thunder Dragon Tornado had been an A-rank. And he'd been looking forward to trying to get the equipment Shadow Clone down as well. Oh well. He shrugged mentally. If the old man specifically wanted to teach it to him, then it must have been something incredible. Lay it on me old man. Confident as always I see, good, you'll need it for this technique. Hiruzen nodded approvingly. What I will be teaching you is a very special technique that only those who have been considered for the Hokage position have been taught and requires a vast amount of chakra to use. So much so, that it requires three others on the level of a Kage to use. Not even Kakashikuen is capable of this technique. Oh, the excitement that had dimmed roared to life once more. Not even Kakashiha? He noted eagerly. So who all from our village can use it? He wanted to see just who exactly he was going to be comparing to here. It's a very short list, but if you want to know I suppose there's no harm, Hiruzen mused. Well of course there is myself, but beyond me there is the Shodame, the Nidame, and the Yandame. Of course, you probably won't be surprised that Madara Uchiha learned the technique, or rather helped create it. From there, Sakumo Hataki, Orochimaru, Jiraiya, Tsunade, my old friend Danzo whom you've spoken to and Kushina Uzumaki. In the history of the Leaf Village only 11 people have mastered this technique, you will be the 12th. Huh, that was a bigger list than he was expecting. Wait, something of what he said just clicked. Kushina Uzumaki was a Hokage candidate? He gaped. That he did not know at all. Mind blown. Initially, before she gave up the idea in favor of Minato Kuin, Haruzen revealed, Kushinachan was a very powerful shinobi, perhaps the greatest seal master this village has ever seen. 
surpassing even Mito-sama. She had volumes of chakra that surpassed even mine, and with her natural bloodline and abilities of being a pure-blooded Uzumaki Jinchuriki of the Kyuubi alongside her powerful wind and water jutsu, she was a force to be reckoned with. Ah, uh, that was interesting to know. While he'd always thought Kushina was a badass, a hot badass that was capable of even holding down the Kyuubi, he hadn't thought she'd been all that much stronger than a jonin. But no. According to the old man, she was stronger than Kakashi was. Interesting. Though, sadly more trivia than anything now since her apparent strength was useless now. What with her fine but being a rotting corpse now. Neat. Guess it's no wonder Naruto has such monstrous amounts of chakra then, he shrugged. As in according to Isabu, the guy had like five times the amount of chakra Daiki himself had currently. So, then what is this technique then? It is called the Four Red Yang Formation, Hiruzen replied. A technique so great, that when in use, not even the Kyuubi itself would be able to break out of. Daiki's eyes widened in shock. Isn't that the technique the old man and the other previous Hokage used to literally box in the Jubi and no sell its Bijudama? Now that was a technique worth learning. Quite. Isabu agreed, and Daiki could hear the slight shock in the Bijou's own tone. With one hand holding a pen and scrawling away at papers atop his deck, while the other idly drummed his fingers atop the solid sturdy piece created by the first Hokage himself, Hiruzen found temptation beginning to get the better of him. His eyes flickered towards the crystal ball sat atop a velvet cushion at the edge of his deck, all but beckoning him to peer inside. It was the only thing in the entire village, perhaps even the world, that would allow someone to peer into the depths of the Hokage monument and see the interior of the training space deep within it. I had forgotten just how much fun it was to teach a student. The old man smiled wryly to himself. The past week had been a rather enjoyable time for him. Imparting what he knew upon young Daikikuen was exciting and nostalgic all in one. Spending time with the boy in such close proximity over the last week had been like spending time with all three of his students once more. The tenacity and loud-mouthed confidence of Jiraiya, the snarky pride backed up by absurd resilience of Tsunade, and the sheer clever genius of Orochimaru. He was not ashamed to admit. His chest ached a little bit as he remembered those days gone by. Oh, Orochimaru. He shook his head and suppressed the feeling of melancholy that began to assert itself at the thought of his once most promising student. The fear of the boy, and he would always be that quiet, sad little boy to him, had gained upon seeing the fate of his parents had twisted him in all the worst ways. He was hardly even recognizable as the boy he taught years ago. But, Daiki was not Orochimaru not even close. While the talent was there and the greed, the deep hunger for Jutsu and a fear the boy did his best to hide under a facade of supreme confidence. The difference was truly as clear as day to him. Orochimaru could never have allowed a bijou to have such sway over him, have his life in its hands. He would never have allowed something as banal as canal desire to waylay him from his pursuit of strength. He would never have lost his temper over a fellow shinobi putting their very body at risk using a forbidden jutsu to win a fight. No, rather Orochimaru who had never been close to anyone outside of their team, would have simply taken the chance to study the eight gates in use in front of his very eyes. Yes, while Daiki had all the best traits of Orochimaru that made him become a monster in the end, they were balanced by the worst traits of Jiraiya that made him the clown everyone once looked down upon. But what let him become the man he was today? A man whose hands he could safely leave the fate of village in should he perish. If the man had wanted the position at least. These days, Jiraiya Kuin was stronger than him and even in his prime, he would be hard-pressed to defeat his perverted student with even his incomplete senjutsu. Should he ever manage to master it, Jiraiya would surely have surpassed him at his strongest. Speaking of Jiraiya, Hiruzen placed his pen down inside. Will you stop lurking out there and come in already? He said aloud, rolling his eyes. A moment later, the window behind him was slid open and a chuckle echoed out as Jiraiya climbed in. No hiding from you, Hasensei? The man grinned at his back. Sorry, sorry. I saw this amazing chick with a massive rack just as I got here. Had to take a minute to give her a luxy, total milf material, you know? She'll be perfect for my next book. Do try to be creative with your characters' names this time. Will you? Haruzan snorted. Neither Tsunade nor Kushina ever forgave you for using them as the main heroines of your first two books. 
They were just playing it up. They totally loved it. Jiraiya merely gave a booming, unashamed laugh as he closed the window leaned against it. In fact, Minato used that to spice up their time in the bedroom. Actually, you could say it's thanks to me a certain little someone came about so quickly. Watching your prized pupil engage in intercourse with his wife. Truly, I should have had you locked up long ago. Hiruzen shook his head. Now, now, sensei. Let's not throw stones in glasses houses, eh? Jiraiya retorted. We both know you read my book and are eagerly waiting for the next installment. Humph. Hiruzen did not dignify that with a response. Even if his eyes did flicker briefly down to his palm where a certain seal now lay inscribed. A much better hiding place than the old hidden drawer in his desk. So, what brings you to see me? Shouldn't you be busy training Naruto Kuen? That was one of the main reasons why he'd recalled the man to the village after all. It was not long ago that Naruto first drew upon the Kyuubi's chakra during his mission to wave. He'd wished to keep the boy from interacting with the beast for as long as possible. For when he did, it would be the start of a long difficult time, but was no putting it off any longer. Naruto Kuen, despite his heritage, did not have access to the tools that would allow him to suppress the beast that his mother and Mitosama did. And the more he reached into the seal, the more the QB would be able to reach into him as well. That's pretty much why I'm here, Sensei, Jiraiya shrugged. He's training against his clones right now, but he's more or less got the hang of the summoning jutsu and pulling on at least a small part of the Kyuubi's chakra, though he still wastes an absurd amount of it when using any jutsu. I'm not a great help on that part, though. Yes, he was well aware. Chakra control was perhaps his student's worst attribute and why he was terrible when it came to using Jinjutsu and had been unable to perfect his sage mode to this day. Chakra control will always be a struggle for the boy as long as the Kyuubi loathes him. Hiruzen pointed out, the fact the boy could use any jutsu at all reliable was a testament to his talent actually. He had many factors working against him. Even as a baby, Naruto was born with an immense amount of chakra. From the simple fact that he was an Uzumaki born to a father as powerful as Minato and Kushina, the Jinchuriki of the Kyuubi alongside being an Uzumaki, never mind the fact that even as a fetus he was exposed constantly to the beast's chakra, meant he was always destined to stand heads and shoulders above his peers when it came to sheer chakra. And the more chakra one had, the harder it was to control. But beyond even that was how his seal worked. It was a beauty of a seal that Hiruzen himself could not replicate half the quality of even if he knew how to perform the seal himself. It siphoned part of the Kyuubi's chakra constantly and filtered it into Naruto's own chakra coils. Meaning that not only was his chakra capacity constantly growing, but also always in a state of flux, making it that much harder to control. And it did not stop there. The Kyuubi's chakra was not only absurdly dense and powerful, but filled with malicious hatred that made it outright corrosive. Not even Mitosama or Kushina could handle it, which was why they suppressed its power. Naruto, on the other hand, had been exposed to the chakra since the very moment he was conceived and was especially attuned to it. It was not a stretch to say that Naruto was born to be the Jinchuriki of the Kyuubi. That did not mean he was immune to the effects of the malicious corrosive hatred within the beast's chakra though. The chakra itself fought tooth and nail against Naruto's own worsening his control even further. Yes, Hiruzen could confidently state that if the beast were sealed within himself, when he lacked an ability to suppress its power, he would likely never be able to use Jutsu again. It was a massive double-edged sword and by time Naruto Kuen reached Hiruzen's own age, should he live that long, the boy's chakra would dwarf his own, in fact, dare he say, he might even dwarf that of Hashirama-sama. And should he ever manage to tame the beast or earn its allegiance like Killer B or Daiki Kuen himself, he would become unstoppable and may very well surpass the first Hokage and Madara Uchiha themselves. Yeah, well, much as we can't help him that much beyond training on that front, we do have somebody who can now, don't we? Jiraiya replied. Perhaps? Hiruzen pursed his lips. The situation is rather different in Daikikuin's case though. Not only had he saved the Sanbai and earned its friendship, it was a lot more docile than the QB and vastly weaker. While he had not combated all the bijou in his lifetime, he'd faced off against quite a few and had first-hand accounts of them from Hashirama-sama. According to him, the Kyuubi was so powerful it could have fought all of the other eight bijou at once. And came out the victor. While all the other bijou had a variety of abilities, the Kyuubi did not. But what it lacked in versatility, 
it made up for in sheer raw strength and power. It was said that if the QB had so desired, it could have destroyed the entire planet, such was its power. Not saying they aren't, that kid's a perfect Jinchuriki. Just from that factor alone, he's someone even we can't take lightly in a full-on fight even though he's just a brat right now, Jiraiya said. But, it's weighing heavy on Naruto and that sand kid has him spooked. That kid Daiki might not be able to tell him how to control the Kyuubi's chakra but he can show him how to use it and he can show Naruto that being a Jinchuriki doesn't have to be something to be ashamed about it. That was true. Haruzen did concede to that point. In fact, Daiki was vastly different from most Jinchuriki. He in fact relished in what he was, was proud to be the Sanbai Jinchuriki. In fact, the boy had referred to himself as the Great Lord Sanbai Jinchuriki-sama a few times during their training. If it weren't for the fact his status was generally being kept a secret from the common populace, the boy would probably boast about his status to anyone and everyone and preach the superiority of being a Jinchuriki over the common pleb. And yes, that was the boy's own words. Where is the kid anyway? Jiraiya asked. I know you said you were training him, but I've not seen him at all. Checked his place and everything and hey, did you know that Orochimaru's old super hot apprentice is living at his house right now? And how the hell does a kid like him afford a place like that anyway? I did, they're sleeping together in fact and both will be going on an important mission soon together. Hiruzen snorted, taking a bit of amusement in the way Jiraiya's eyes. As for how he afforded it, well an A-rank bounty and a best friend who gave him a discount I do believe. Honestly, the boy fixing Anko's seal and her truly going through with her promise to sleep with him was a true boon right now. Not only did it help her, even strengthen her in fact according to her own testimony, she made for an amazing stopgap to Wall of Mei Terumi. After all, while he trusted Daiki and his character quite implicitly, he could not say the temptation of getting to bed Mei Terumi would not be the highest of temptations. Even he himself may be tempted, never mind a lad as young as Daiki. A woman such as her was the true bane of young talented shinobi everywhere. It truly was a wonder the woman hadn't managed to snatch a man for herself up and by all accounts he'd been told by his informants. Desired marriage. You're kidding me. A kid at that age bagged at a haughty older chick like that? Jiraiya gaped, eyes shining with fervent jealousy. Seriously, perfect Jinchuriki. The next pick for the hat and a babe like that. It's like he was born to make guys like me feel inadequate. Makes me want to beat him up. I wouldn't let him know that. It will just make him preen all the greater. Hiruzen chortled. Though, she did only go through with sleeping with him because he fixed her cursed seal. Wait, what? Jiraiya's eyes widened in absolute shock. Oh, did he forget tell Jiraiya that? Oh well, it served him right for always making trouble for him. The amount of times he got complaints about the man peeping was truly annoying. Name, Daiki Yuri. Age 13. Chakra Capacity. 195. 000-195. Low Tier Kage. Strength. 205. Endurance. 293. Durability. 207. Agility. 205. Taijutsu, 262 out of 500 ninjutsu, 390 slash 500 jinjutsu, 107 slash 500 bukajutsu, 184 slash 500, chakra control, 325 slash 500, chakra affinities, lightning, expert the heaven spark, water, expert the sea parts before you, wind, master the gale bows, earth, adept the earth shakes, Fire, novice simmering power. Fuinjutsu, advanced the breath hitches. Seven days of training with the professor and second god of Shinobi himself did the body good, that was for sure. It might have only been a week, but skill-wise, his growth had been utterly explosive and he'd gained much more in the single week than he had in months of training himself. Especially since he'd long since concluded that his stat growth was not linear at all and the higher his stats became, the harder they became to raise. What do you think? He asked inwardly as he rested on his backside against one of the wide expansive walls of the training ground he had been living in for the past week. His training had come to an end and right now, he was just catching his breath and recovering from the beating he'd been put through by the old man's clones. That you sure have put a lot of time and effort into still being a squishy little boy. Isabu replied. 
compared to you, for now. Daiki rolled his eyes. Well, comparing you to other humans at least, I dare say you would be capable of fighting on even footing with Raiga Kurosaki if your memories of him are anything to go by, if not a bit greater than him, Isabu mused after moment of thought after ribbing him. With your heavenly star seal, I believe you would dominate him and should be capable of even proving a challenge to your man crush Kakashi. Daiki snorted. Please, like I've said before, even if I was into dudes I'd have way better taste than Kakashi, he replied, before looking up at the ceiling multiple hundreds of feet above him. Still, pretty much a lower class A rank then, and then mid to upper class with the seal. He mused. That wasn't bad at all. And while he still couldn't use the lightning armor for long without damaging himself, he'd gotten a little bit more control of it with his increase in ability with his lightning element and lessened the damage a little bit so he could use it for a little bit longer right now. With that, he might be able to put up a fight against an S-rank shinobi for a decent little while and have a slight chance of victory without having to rely on Isabu. Perhaps, Isabu replied lightly, which was was decent confirmation considering how many high-level shinobi he'd borne personal witness to battling it out. Either way, it made it so that only a select few would be capable of bringing him down in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, or even outnumbering him. Frankly, even taking him by surprise would be a mission and a half at this point. Just then, the entrance into the training ground opened up and in walked the old man who'd been beating his but all week long. Unlike usual, he was dressed in his red and white Hokage robes instead of his combat gear. And following behind him was a huge, white-haired figure. Huh, so this is what this place looks like inside. Pretty big. Jiraiya commented as he looked around. Not really my style though. I'm not big on the whole dark, dank underground thing. Now if it were out in the open where I could show off to the ladies I might have been tempted. Hello, Daiki Kuen. Haruzan ignored his student and smiled at the youngest of the three as he made his way over. How are you feeling? Pretty good. Daiki shrugged, giving the man a smirk as he dismissed the status screen with a thought. Just basking in my awesomeness old man before I leave the sweet, but pad that only awesome people like me can appreciate the worth of. Haruzan chortled. Is that a dig at me? Jiraiya turned to him and raised an eyebrow at him. I mean kid, you might be hot fool for being a muscle-headed freak at your age, but I'd still wreck you any day of the week. Honestly I'd get more of a challenge spanking my meat. I hear that happens when you get to that age. Daiki snorted. Or is it because of how many times you've left chicks who caught you peeping on them stomp all over your masochistic ass? Take some permanent damage down there? Sensei, this kid's a fool, Jiraiya said, turning to the Hokage. I thought he was just a crazy weirdo, a super lucky one after what you told me. But now he's a fool on top of that. You sure he's a good pick for the hat? Unfortunately Jiraiya, being a fool as you call it, does not disqualify one out of the running for being Hokage, the old man shrugged, puffing on his pipe. Actually, I dare say Toborama-sensei would prefer it that way. Heh. Daiki jutted his chin out proudly and arrogantly. I really need to find out how strong that crap you smoke is one of these days, sensei. It must be some real high-quality stuff. Jiraiya shook his head with a huff, before promptly sobering and turning back to meet Daiki's eyes. So, you're probably wondering why I turned up with Saratobi-sensei, right? He asked. Not really... Daiki shrugged. You're his student, so not really all that odd for you to be around him. Though, you bringing it up is another matter and makes it apparent you wanted to see me for something. But considering Jiraiya should be in the middle of training Naruto right now during the lead-up to the Chunin exams, then it made him think it had something to do with him. The only other thing it could be for was in relation to Orochimaru or the Cursed Seal. Fair enough, Jiraiya nodded. I'll be blunt kid. I want your help to train Naruto. Ah, if you wanted him specifically for help teaching Naruto, then there was really only one reason it would be for. I won't be able to help him control the QB. Daiki denied instantly, shaking his head. Just because he knew in a possible future that Naruto would earn his respect in full and they would become friends and could reveal the threat of Madara the Jubi and Kagaya, did not mean he would be able to get Kurama to play ball. It would be the opposite in fact I'm afraid, Isabu spoke up. Prideful as my sibling is, Kurama would take that information and stubbornly dig his feet in all the more and make it even harder. My own presence in actuality would be more detrimental if we revealed the truth and believe we are just trying to manipulate him. 
At best, they could use his ego to get a bit of help from him if they left out the parts about him becoming friends with Naruto. But, it would be an uneasy truce liable to break at any moment. No, the best thing to do would be to let their relationship play out for the most part and not interfere. I figured as much, Jiraiya shrugged. You can't reach him how to tame the QB just because you're friends with the Sanbai. That's two completely different situations. But, you can teach him how to use his abilities right? That he could do. I can teach him the basics of the chakra cloaks and give him some advice, but any special abilities I get from this Sanbai are much different from his. Daiki responded, nodding even if his words hitched for a moment in the middle. You can call me the Sanbai to others and not say my name you know. I won't get offended. Isabu told him. He simply shrugged and didn't reply. Good. You're learning. Isabu commented approvingly. That'll do, Jiraiya grinned. Besides, the kid needs to know there isn't anything wrong with him being the QB Jinchuriki. He got the role forced on him, but you chose it willingly. Getting to understand that will go a long way to helping him out, I think, and that you aren't all like that sand kid. Ah yes, Gara. He had actually forgotten Raccoon Boy had all but traumatized Naruto when they met after the prelims. That said, this was a chance for him to to get his hands on something else he needed. Or at least the beginnings of it. Fine. If the old man okays it, I've got a big mission soon you know, Daiki agreed. But on one condition, Naruto pissed me off the last time we saw each other after all even after I busted my but saving his team and healing Sakura. Greedy aren't ya? Jiraiya rolled his eyes. Fine. What do you want in return? Senjutsu. He said simply. Ho. Oh. Haruzen raised an eyebrow in interest. Jiraiya on the other hand, narrowed his eyes. Yeah. No. Kid, you're talented for sure, and even learning about that at your age is impressive. But no, there's no way you can manage it. He refuted instantly. Besides, I can't teach it. Only the Toads can, and in signing the contract isn't something that can be done all willy-nilly. Not for me, Daiki replied, standing up and dusting off his clothes. I already have a summoning contract after all, way better than Toads by the way. I want you to get your summons to teach my boss summon how to use Senjutsu. After all, he didn't have the time to be learning it right now. Nor was he anywhere near as predisposed to it as Naruto. But Shiramaru was an entirely different matter and should be well capable of learning it. That big guy had had spent over 50 years in the same exact spot disguised as a castle. He had the whole sitting still thing down to an art form at this point. And he had no doubt his boss summon could learn Senjutsu. And then later down the line, when Daiki had more free time, he could learn it himself from Shiramaru. Oh yeah, the chameleons, I forgot you had that contract. Jiraiya cocked his head to the side and pursed his lips. That might be different, but I'd still need to ask. I can't promise it'll work out or anything. Well, I'm not going anywhere right now, am I? Daiki replied. Or, am I? He looked to the Hokage. I will delay the mission until tomorrow, Saratobi replied. Even if this does not work out the way you desire, you still have to agree to train Naruto. Daiki shrugged. Fine with me, that won't take long anyway. He replied in turn. It wasn't exactly rocket science, a couple hours should be enough to beat it into the idiot's head. Though it did bring up a question. Why do you not know Senjutsu old man? He asked. Hiruzen merely laughed lightly. Oh my summons were incapable of learning the art, as was I. I'm afraid I'm just not very compatible with the art. He replied, truly regrettable, but not everyone is capable of it. Not even Toborama sensei was capable of harnessing the power. And even Minato Kuen failed to grasp the art in full. Jiraiya is the only one alive in this day and age capable of using it in combat as far as we humans go to my knowledge. Man, when it first came up, Senjutsu was played up as an incredibly powerful art that even the best of the best struggled with. The fact that not even the old man or the second could manage it really hit that factor home for him. Crap, would he even be capable of it? Yeah, I've been at it decades kid and I've still not mastered it. Jiraiya snorted when he saw Daiki's eyes widen. You sure you want to try for it? I hear you're pretty good at seals. Why not have me teach you a few instead? Tempting. But no. Nah, long shot it might be. But even if it's hard, I want to at least attempt it. He replied. In the end, he simply wasn't a little bitch and would as always believe in the heart of the grind to see him through. 
Fair enough, kid, Jiraiya nodded. Give me a minute and I'll bring one of the sages here, he said, before closing his eyes and clasping his hands together. Daiki's eyes widened. While he hadn't at all trained with Isabu's sensory abilities yet, he was still well capable of seeing Chakra with his eyes. And as soon as he closed his eyes and clasped his hands together, Jiraiya began to focus an absolutely monstrous amount of chakra into his clasped hands. And by monstrous, he meant monstrous. It built up, and up and up, until within Jiraiya's hands was a chakra amount that surpassed his own full capacity. Jiraiya's eyes snapped open about 30 seconds later, and he crouched down to slam his hands onto the ground, summoning Jutsu. He declared and a massive puff of smoke erupted from the ground where his hands made contact. What in tarnation? A croaky, elderly male voice cried out from within the smoke. Jiraiya boy, the heck you doing summoning me for? When the huge tower of smoke dissipated a few moments later, it was to reveal a tiny little green toad standing bipedal. A small brown cloak covering its form and with bushy gray eyebrows over its eyes. No doubt about it, it was Pa, one of the two sages of the Toad Summons clan and the one who taught Naruto how to harness Senjutsu. And to summon him, Jiraiya just spent nearly ten times as much chakra as it took Daiki himself to summon Shiramaru. Holy hell man. Sorry Pa. Jiraiya gave the small toad a sheepish smile, rubbing the back of his head. Something came up I need to talk to you about. HM? Better be good boya. I was just bout to sit down to Ma's maggot stew. Pa huffed then took his glowing yellow eyes off of the white-haired Sanin and looked at Daiki, raised a single bushy brow, before looking to Haruzen. Well, if it isn't young Haruzen-chan, it's been a while since I seen you monkey boy. It's nice to see you again, Pa. Haruzen inclined his head respectfully. Though, I'm hardly a young boy anymore. Bah! You're still a whippersnapper to me, boy. Pa snorted, waving him off. Now then, who's this lad then? Quite the powerful chakra this one has for being but a tadpole. The old toad turned his attention back to Daiki and scrutinized him with ancient eyes. How old was Pa again? This brat's the reason I summoned you Pa. Jiraiya waved his arm at the boy. Kid's a weirdo, he's a perfect Jinchuriki. Sealed the Sanbai in himself a few months ago and got its allegiance. I want his help with teaching Naruto how to use the Kyuubi's power properly. But he wants something in return. QB Jinchuriki, huh? I see. Pa clicked his tongue and didn't comment at all on his own status. But his gaze did sharpen and Daiki felt a pressure settle on his shoulders. Well then boy, what you want? Can't be something as simple as signing the contract. Jiraiya boy could handle that and would have brought out Bunta boy if not instead of me. I want you to teach my boss summon how to use Senjutsu. Daiki replied bluntly. There was no point dancing around the issue. Either the old toad would do it or he wouldn't simple as that. Pa stared at him silently for a moment, before promptly, snorting, That's so tadpole? He chortled. And why is that? Because I want to learn Senjutsu myself, Daiki shrugged. I've not got the time for it right now, nor am I ready for it myself. That's for sure, Pa snorted. I can tell that from just a mere glance at you boy you're a long ways off. Annoying, but hardly enough to stop him in his tracks. Yeah, like I said, Daiki rolled his eyes. My summons though, specifically the boss are a completely different matter though, and I'll be able to get their help to learn it myself later. Hmm. Pa hummed and scrutinized him keenly for a moment. And what summon clan do you represent then, boy? The Chameleon Clan. Daiki replied. Pa blinked. Oh, that brings me back. He shook his head. I did hear young Shiramaru finally return to his clan after gaining a new summoner. You must be something special to catch the eye of that stubborn little lizard. Young? Shiramaru was over a hundred years old. Well, he's definitely not allied with the snakes at least. Not after the falling out he had with his dear whippersnapper of a papa little manda boy. Humph. Pa huffed, taking his attention off of Daiki to look at Jiraiya and Haruzen. What say you two lads? Can you speak for the lad's character? Do you think he's worthy of it? Jiraiya shrugged, which was fair. They barely knew each other. The white-haired man looked to his elderly teacher. The human one. Well, if it helps Pa, I've chosen the boy specifically to become the next Hokage. The successor to Minato. Hiruzen revealed. 
Pa's eyes widened and he whipped his small head around to stare at Daiki in shock. Minato-chan's successor? I see. He nodded. Very well, boy. I will contact the Chameleon Clan and give the offer to Shiramaru boy. I won't promise anything, though. It will be down to the lad's own talent. He'll manage it just fine. Daiki smirked. He had full confidence in his summons. The chameleons were just that badass. He would be much further behind than he was right now if not for them. Once Pa left back home to enjoy his maggot stew, it was time for Daiki to leave the Hokage training ground behind for the first time in a week. It was the first time he saw sunlight in that week and would have strained his eyes a bit. If not for the fact his eyes were special and saw bright lights every second of every day regardless of if it was day or not. Sadly, while Daiki would have loved to head home for a little bit, he had a deal to pay out on. And so out into the forests with Jiraiya he went, to meet a familiar spiky-haired blonde. Aero Senen. Where the hell have you be dash? Naruto, right in the middle of a set of push-ups with multiple bags of what appeared to be sand tied all over his body began to demand as they appeared, only to pause and blink when he saw Daiki with him. The hell are you doing here? He asked pushing himself up and crossing his arms. He'd discarded his orange jacket and so was only wearing a mesh shirt and orange pants, which meant he could see much of his bare torso. The boy, while short, was packed with rigid powerful muscle. Not as powerful and glorious as his own, of course, but the hard training the boy put himself through showed. Though, the sandbags were much less efficient than his own method of weight training. I went looking for this brat here, shrimpy brat, Jiraiya shrugged. I figured he'd be able to teach you something much better than me. Ha! Huh? The hell you on about? Naruto scowled, crossing his arms. It was easy to see the boy was still upset with him about his attitude regarding Lee. I thought you were some super sanin like that snake face bastard. Some great shinobi you are if you need some kid my own age to teach me something. Ah, shut up, kid. I'm the gallant Jiraiya. You won't ever find another shinobi as badass and cool as me. Jiraiya waved the boy off. The little muscle head beside me just has something in common with you that I don't. Naruto snorted at him. Yeah, and what's that pervert? I'm a Jinchuriki like you. Daiki cut in. Time was wasting after all. I'm here to teach you how to use the Kyuubi's chakra properly. Naruto's bright blue eyes instantly widened in horror. You know. He swallowed heavily, his shoulders trembling for a moment. Wait. Like me? You have a monster in you too. In response, Daiki scoffed. The bijou aren't monsters, moron. They're huge masses of chakra that people stuffed in guys like you to make super shinobi that can use their power, he replied. In that respect, we're nothing alike. You're a pansy that that got the strongest of them all handed to you at birth, whereas I went out and found the sand by myself and sealed it in myself. He'd already long since played a situation like this out in his head before, and he'd come to the simple realization that angering Naruto instead of letting him wallow in his self-pity over it would be the best course of action. Jiraiya face-palmed. W what? Naruto gaped at him. Why, why would you do that? How did you do that? For once, he'd rendered Naruto quiet through sheer shock. Why wouldn't I? Daiki crossed his arms and smirked cockily. Being a Jinchuriki makes me superior to any normal ninja. Not only do I get the Sanbai special abilities and he has a ton, but I also heal faster, my chakra grows massively and recovers faster and I can draw on its strength. Did you think I was talking crap when I said I could easily crush all of you back at the prelims? Naruto outright grimaced. Just for power? Everyone has always hated me. I've been alone all this time with no parents or anything because of the QB inside me. And you want the same thing? Just for power? Oh, grow up Naruto, seriously. It's for your own good. Daiki shot back. Why the hell would you care what your lessers think of you? The only ones that cared at all were weaklings and civilians. An easy trade-off in my opinion. You've got more chakra than 10,000 of those weaklings put together. You've got more chakra than me. Do you understand how absurd that is? Kids? Kids? Calm down a bit, won't you? Jiraiya sighed and felt the need to step in. This really wasn't what I had in mind. But no, Daiki wasn't having it. He wanted him to help Naruto? He would. And the blonde would be all the better off for it, both physically and mentally. Hell, he'd be happier in the end. Buzz off, old man. 
Go set up a barrier to stop anyone from sensing chakra within this area and leave us to it. Daiki jutted his chin at him. I'll be making Naruto see sense, but if anyone senses the Kyuubi's chakra they'll freak out. Jiraiya hesitated, but Daiki narrowed his eyes at him, and then with a mental tug, he called upon his closet ally's power. Almost casually, a bubbling cloak of sizzling red chakra formed around his body, splitting into three huge, thick tails at his back and waving languidly in the air. He was making a point. Jiraiya grimaced, understanding, Fine, but I won't be far. He conceded and disappeared in a blur using a shun shin. Only then did Naruto speak up. That chakra, like it. Daiki spread his arms wide and invitingly, massive grin on his face. This is what is called the version 1 bijou cloak. It's the step up from that little aura you can call on right now. You can draw right up to as many tails as your bijou has. In your case, that would be nine. As he finished speaking, he saw the air ripple above them as a clear translucent barrier formed. I don't even know what's going on, but I can tell it's super strong. Naruto grudgingly admitted. I still don't get it Daiki. Sure it's strong, but why would you want it? Don't you remember the QB attacked the village, it killed so many people. It's why I grew up hated and without parents. I don't want to use its power unless I need to. And, Daiki replied, the QB killed my parents too. My dad died in its initial attack and my mom two years later because of its chakra that infected her. But you don't see me whining about it. That did it. Naruto's eyes narrowed in anger. It killed your parents? And you don't care? He demanded, baring his teeth. Don't put words in my mouth, loser. Daiki scoffed at him. I didn't say I didn't care. I just don't blame the fox for it. You don't blame it? How it killed them? Naruto snarled. Rage beginning to overtake him. His eyes bleeding red and his pups elongating into feral slits. As expected, Naruto, because of his own lack of parents, was very big on the whole family thing. Him besmirching his own in any way made him seem entitled even if they were dead. How predictable. We're shinobi idiot. Daiki shot back. We fight, we kill, and we die. If you decided to become a shinobi and chase after being the Hokage hat without even realizing that simple fact, then you're even further below me than I thought. Naruto trembled in his spot, sheer anger enveloping his body in a literal red haze of chakra. Just a little bit more. It's no wonder the old man has decided to make me the next Hokage after him, while you aren't even a footnote despite having the strongest being in the world to draw strength from. Daiki jutted his chin out arrogantly and looked down on the boy. And thus it began. Liar! A beastly roar tore its way from Naruto's throat, and the blonde rushed him in a blur of speed most jonin would have trouble keeping up with, and was promptly batted aside by a single tail that whipped out faster than the blonde could react, sending him flying through multiple trees. The blonde was buried under multiple large fallen trees within moments. A pile of trees that were promptly blown high into the air, as if they were made of paper when the boy shot to his feet and spread his arms wide. With a snarl, Naruto once again shot towards Daiki in a blur of speed that tore a trench in the ground at his feet. Not even a blink of an eye later, the boy was upon him and lashing out with a rapid barrage of clawed swipes, punches and kicks, each one capable of shattering a boulder. Yet with ease, Daiki parried his blows, hopped over them, dodged with the smallest of motions. Look at you! Daiki laughed as he spun around Naruto's next blow and buried his elbow in the blonde's face, breaking his nose with an audible crunch and sending him tumbling backwards in multiple rolls. Only the very bare minimum of the Kyuubi's chakra and you're already at the point where you demolish Sasuke, your big rival. Yet you whine about it so much, he goaded. Shut up! Naruto bounced to his feet, nose already healed and roared. The sheer power put into his voice conjured a pure on shock wave that blasted out towards him, tearing up thick trees over fifty feet tall as if they were little sticks caught in a hurricane, only to be rent asunder as he swiped one of his three chakra tails up over his head and down in a blade-like motion. Really Naruto, a shock wave against me? That's my thing bro. Daiki laughed at him. Naruto growled, bringing his hands up into a familiar cross seal. Shadow clone jutsu? He shouted and a moment later, 
Three clones enshrouded with the same sizzling red chakra cloak puffed into existence beside him. And together they rushed him, and Daiki rushed them. His three tails tore out from behind in, flashing through the air like a trio of crimson yandames and smashed into the three clones before they could do even make it halfway towards him. And then he was physically in Naruto's face, faster than he himself could react to and his hand wrapped around the blonde's throat and hefted him up into the air. And then, he began draining the boy's chakra, threefold. With his chakra armor, the chakra absorbing seal added to his dimension force seal and the chakra absorption jutsu he'd stolen from that sunglasses wearing fool that simped for Orochimaru. Naruto's eyes widened and he began to trash in his grip, arms and legs kicking out violently, his sizzling red cloak of chakra burning at his own. But managing nothing in the end, before long, the boy went limp in his grip and the cloak of chakra around him dwindled away bit by bit. Store that in the seal, will you? He said inwardly. He already had quite the collection of Sasuke's chakra from all the times they'd sparred. Now he had Naruto's as well. And quite a lot of it actually. And he'd take the time to cultivate both for his own uses. Already on it. Isabu replied. Brilliant. Sorry about this Naruto, but it's necessary. He apologized to the blonde boy in his grip. The boy's bright blue eyes dim and half-lidded. He was on the edge of losing consciousness. In the first place, the likelihood of Naruto having any true mental defenses were slim at best. Sasuke slipped right on in with just the Sharingan after all. But it was better to be safe than sorry. Besides, this little slapathon they just had proved the point of his strength and why Jinchuriki were superior than normal people. He narrowed his eyes onto Naruto's own and with his eyes, slipped into his mind, projecting his consciousness into his own just as he did before with Anko. And moments later, Daiki left the physical world behind and found himself standing ankle-deep in murky water, within a huge metallic hallway. Beside him, Naruto sat on his backside in the water, staring up at him in shock. So this is your seal, huh? Daiki commented, looking around idly. Should have guessed the guy who came up with the sexy jutsu would have a gutter for a mind. This is my seal thing. How did you get in here? The blonde, now much more subdued after the butt kicking he'd received asked in shock. Eh, I've got special eyes. Better than Sasuke's by the way, he replied and added. Now let's go talk to a big fluffy fox, shall we? He grinned down at Naruto holding his hand out for him to take it. Despite the slight mocking tone he'd given about the state of Naruto's mindscape soulscape, whatever it was scape, Daiki was astounded by it. He had to shut off his ability to see chakra, simply because the sheer amount of it permeating even the outer halls away from the main area where the nine-tailed bijou was located, was almost blinding. The wall, the pipes running along the walls, the air, the water he stood upon. The saturation of chakra dwarfed his own and then some, that was for sure. Not only that, but the sheer amount of yang chakra in comparison to Ian is absurd, Isabu commented. It's no wonder the boy's healing factor is so powerful and how he stands above his peers of his year beyond the Uchiha boy and yourself physically. I wonder if the Yandame Hokage took this into account. It does explain a few things. Daiki mused inwardly as he traversed the seal halls. It was not like Naruto did not train, in fact, out of their graduating class, the only people that trained harder than the blonde were Sasuke and Daiki himself. But, the quality of his training was abysmal. He was mostly self-taught, and he made his own training up as he went. And while it worked, it was inefficient compared to his own training or the likes Rock Lee went through. Yet, canonically, by the time Naruto had returned from his trip to find Tsunade, he was physically superior to Sasuke who was at that point on par with Rock Lee Speedwise. That did not make sense. Despite his hard efforts, Naruto was not geared towards being a speedster. He was geared to being a juggernaut. Yes, it seems this overabundance of Yang Chakra is helping his musculature develop and strengthen at a much greater rate than usual, offsetting his subpar training. Isabu agreed. I hazard to guess that even if he did not train, as he aged towards adulthood, he would still passively become stronger from it. That was kind of crap, and that was coming from him. I agree, though I find it even more stupefying how such potential has been squandered. Isabu hummed. If he had proper training from his younger years like much of his peers, I have no doubts that he would already be on the level of a kage. That thought almost made Daiki sneer in disgust. 
that was tantamount to heresy as far as he was concerned and why kindness could also be a weakness. The old man was far too soft in this case. He could still have been kind while being strict with Naruto and in his place, Daiki would have installed the proper method of the grind in him from a young age and created a super shinobi that could have rivaled Hashirama without calling on his bijou by time he was 15. To be perfectly honest, he couldn't even say he wouldn't have pulled a danzo with him. To be precise, if he only had the knowledge the old man had to go on currently and not his meta-knowledge, he would have grabbed two Uchiha traders who were close, there were plenty at the time and then kill one of them forcing the other to awaken the Manjikyu and then killed him and taken them as well. Then implanted them within Naruto and had him trained to subdue Kurama with his eyes and force his compliance and make Naruto a pseudo-perfect Jinchuriki. Ruthless pragmatism at its finest, Isabu huffed. I do not condone that idea at all, but from the view of a Hokage that would be the most optimal choice and create a shinobi only the likes of Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha could defeat, and that's generously assuming he had not yet reached his prime yet. Daiki wasn't able to ponder on that though any longer, because Naruto who had been uncharacteristically silent for the last little bit, finally regained at least a bit of his bearings. What did you mean by what you said earlier? The blonde asked, frowning at him thoughtfully. How you don't blame the stupid fox? Just that, he shrugged. Let me ask you something in return Naruto. Why do you think the QB attacked the leaf? How do you think it even got in the vicinity of the leaf village? It walked or ran? Naruto replied with a shrug after a moment of thinking and apparently coming up blank. Haha, no, Daiki snorted. Back then our village had the Yandame and the old man, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, Danzo a guy you've likely never heard of and more. As powerful as the QB is, far stronger than any of them alone, power alone doesn't decide everything and if it just approached our village, it would have been spotted from miles away and all our strongest shinobi would have mobilized and attacked it long before it got to our village and sealed it. And that's not taking into account every other village coveting the QB's power and attacking it as well. Naruto's face scrunched up and he could practically see the rusty gears inside his head turning. So how did it get to our village then? He asked. Because it broke out of its last Jinchuriki? Daiki revealed bluntly. You didn't think you were the first Jinchuriki of it, did you? Naruto stopped, sapphire blue eyes shooting wide open in absolute shock. What? He gaped. There's been more. Yup, to be exact there were two before you, the first being the wife of the Shodame Hokage. Daiki continued on. Long ago, she sealed it inside herself after it was subdued by the Shodame. This is crazy. Naruto shook his head. So the QB attacked the village back then? Ha ha. No. Daiki repeated with another snort. See, this village was founded by the Shodame and a guy called Madara Uchiha. Uchiha. Like Sasuke? Naruto tilted his head. Yeah. Daiki nodded. Back then, they got into a big fight and Madara left the village and went on a rampage across the continent. The Shodame Hokage went to stop him and they got into a big fight, during which Madara enslaved the QB that was just minding its own business and hypnotized it with his Sharingan and used it to fight the Shodame Hokage. Suffice to say, Madara lost the fight and the Shodame decided that the QB was too strong to let just walk around. So he subdued it and had his wife seal it inside herself. He then went and hunted down the other eight bijou, beat the crap out of them and sealed them away as well and then gifted them to the other villages for some hippie piece crap. Well except the Achibi, the one in that Gara kid. The sand had already subdued that one themselves. Huh? Naruto gaped at him. What? No wait, what? I don't understand. Why do that? For peace apparently, Daiki shrugged. Like I said before, Jinchuriki like us are superior to normal ninja. We're basically, when trained right, super ninja. The Shodame was so goddamn strong everyone was afraid of him, so he thought gifting them all the bijou to make their own super ninja to act as weapons would make them feel more secure. I think, honestly, why he gave the bijou out was a mystery to him, even after seeing it with his own eyes. He understood he wanted peaceful coexistence, but he didn't understand why he gave the bijou out beyond him having them at the time. Did he hunt the other bijou because he thought they were too powerful to let roam or because he wanted to use them as a gift? That part wasn't expanded on at all. Personally, I'm not his biggest fan, Isabu commented. I don't know what he was thinking, but I was just relaxing in a nice big lake, sleeping actually when he came out of nowhere, 
dragged me out with that giant wood golem thing of his, beat me up, wrapped me up in giant wooden tendrils and had his wife seal me. In a jar of all things. Yeah, that was the problem with hippies. They never saw anything beyond the vision in front of them. And they were always hypocrites in the end. He could appreciate Hashirama's vision and desires, but not his methods. Quite frankly, the man had no idea what he was doing. If he wanted peace, Daiki had better ideas. In his place, he would have had Madara enslave the other Kage with his eyes like he did Yagura or how Abito did either or. He would have had them preach friendly relations with Kanoha and run the propaganda for them. Which would have also placated Madara as well, at least partially. And if he personally believed the Bijou were too powerful to let roam, he wouldn't have sealed them in breakable objects or people. He would have created large sealed spaces, other dimensions, which he knew Mido should have been capable of from his own understanding of sealing and let them live out their lives there. It would still be imprisoning them, but it would be better than the cramped ways inside a person and used as a weapon. We would have still resented you for subjecting us to your will. But again, a much better plan I do admit. Isabu mused. Frankly, if things played out that way, this entire continent would most likely have become Kanoha, unified under a single banner, even if it would not be perfect. Daiki shrugged inwardly, he never thought it would be. Perfection did not exist after all. If it did, he would already be it. Sure. Isabu snorted. I still don't get it, if what you say is right, then the reason you don't blame the QB is Dash? Naruto rambled. Cause I'd do the exact same thing if I was just enslaved, imprisoned and used as a goddamn weapon just for existing. Daiki cut him off then smirked. In fact, the QB is kinder than me cause in its place, I would have just aimed down with my strongest attack and blown up the entire village and I'll tell you this, the QB is well capable of creating an attack like that within 10 or so seconds at most, if that. Honestly, he was lowballing Karama's ability there. He could probably do it in three. Two. Isabu helpfully added. Naruto's expression twisted into something. Crushed. That was the only way he could describe it. He looked like Daiki had just stolen his crush. Pleasant. Isabu helpfully added once more. Daiki shrugged. It painted a vivid imagery at least. Of course. Daiki continued. This doesn't really help you all that much, Naruto. The QB hates us, and if it ever does get out of you, it'll probably massacre most of Kanoha in retribution. So good luck with that. He added, because that needed to be said. Naruto could sympathize with Kurama all he wanted, but he had to understand that Kurama hated them all for a very viable and understandable reason. And unless Naruto punched him with the power of friendship and became buddy-buddy with him, Kurama would sooner bijudama them than help them. Then why are we going to meet the fox? He asked, eyes lost. Cause I want to see what the big bad QB is like up close and personal and get a feel for its strength. Daiki lied with a shrug. Even if it's only at half strength cause of the Yandame. Wait, what? Oh, did you not know that? Daiki raised his eyebrows at the blonde. Cause you were just a baby? It seems the Yandame wasn't sure you could contain the full power of the QB. So he used a forbidden jutsu called the Reaper Death Seal that sealed away half of the QB's strength inside his own body at the cost of his life. That was it at only half? Naruto's eyes flew wide open and he sputtered. Naruto. A deep voice echoed ominously throughout the mindscape as they entered the main area of the seal. Your patheticness knows no bounds. The Jinchuriki of me. The mighty nine tails being manhandled by a mere three tails Jinchuriki. Shameful. A massive gigantic gate loomed at the other side of the huge, dreary room. And within it, a tantic orange-furred fox with blazing, malice-filled eyes glared out in contempt, yet made no move to stand up as they approached. The QB lay there, head atop its paws and saw no need to rise up to greet them. Karama's position alone indicated how far below him he believed they were. Yes, that would be right. While we have no genders physically, our personalities reflect them in a way. I would say only Matatabi leans towards being female out of us nine. Isabu agreed. Kurama's words at least seemed to snap Naruto out of his funk. Ah! Shut up you stupid fox! The blonde shouted. I was using your power, which I didn't ask for by the way and I still lost. It wasn't just me. We both got our butts kicked. Cage, 
That's just because of how pathetic you are at using not only your own strength but mine. Karama scoffed. If it were me, I would have crushed them. Big talk for a dumb fox stuck in a cage. Naruto snapped back. Your pathetic retorts show just how little you know. Disgraceful. Karama sniffed in disdain. Then those blazing crimson red eyes settled on Daiki. Now why did you come boy? Do you think I'll happily serve this little fool like that pathetic weakling Sanbai does you? Just because you have a slight understanding of where I stand. Hardly, if you heard what I said to Naruto, you already know that I know you won't. Not that I blame you, I wouldn't be too happy in your place either. Daiki snorted himself. No, I just came because I wanted to see the one that killed my parents and see just how powerful you really are. Karama did not react to his words much, beyond a slight tightening of the fur around his eyes. But after a moment of his words hanging in the air, the titanic nine-tailed fox slowly stood up, rising to his full height within the seal. Each of his tails a match for Manda in size and length fanning out behind him. Is that so? Well then, let me give you just a taste of it, boy. The air seemed to still at Karama's words, and then, a searing red wave of pressure erupted from the seal, illuminating everything within the area with a deep dark crimson glow and Daiki's eyes widened as he felt it, Naruto falling to his backside with a gasp as it rushed over them. It was like the world itself was pressing down upon his shoulders and a hate-fueled bloodlust that made Orochimaru's own feel like that of a newborn babes in comparison to the snake Sanin's own swept into his very bones. Lesser Shinobi would lock up and die in fright from the sheer killing intent alone within the chakra pressing down upon him. And the sheer force behind it could probably kill the average newly graduated genin. It was a truly absurd power that even just a mere flare of dwarfed that of Isabu's own even with Daiki's added on top. It was not even a contest. This was the QB, the being that could flatten mountains with a swing of a single tail and cause a tsunami with another. Pure primordial power given life and physical form. The greater part of a god, even in his weakened state. Daiki couldn't stop the cold sweat that erupted from his pores. The power behind Karama truly was insane. And just as suddenly as it started, the wave of chakra stopped and Daiki released a breath he didn't know he was holding. It really was just a taste as Karama said, but the sheer power behind it was mind-boggling. So vast, that even with the ability to sense chakra he'd gained from Isabu, he couldn't see an end to it. The hell was that for you stupid fox? Naruto surged to his feet, shaking his head and baring his fist angrily at Karama. Just cause, you're in a crappy situation doesn't mean you do crap like that. If nothing else, the blonde's mental fortitude was something else. Naive and ignorant he might have been and childish as hell. But there was due denying his courage and backbone. Naruto, do not think just because this boy has told you a small fraction of what led us to this moment, that we are in any way friends, Karama scoffed. You are nothing less than nothing. You are weak and pathetic and can do nothing without me. The only thing that saves you from me is the seal between us. Make no mistake though, I will one day escape this prison and crush you and everything you love. Well what little of it you do because don't ever forget. I know the true you and not that pathetic veneer you show off for those foolish humans to get their attention and acknowledgement. Naruto growled. Bastard fox, and here I was beginning to sympathize with you a bit. He bit out. I'm not gonna let that happen. I'm gonna be the Hokage that surpasses all the other Hokage, and since you couldn't beat the Yandame, no way you'll beat me. Try beating the one beside you first, he's the next Hokage after all I sense no lies in his words. Karama mocked the blonde. It's a good thing he is not my Jinchuriki or I'd have a very hard time getting out. Thankfully I got you a weakling. Naruto visibly grimaced and grit his teeth, but for once didn't shout back. Probably because he didn't know what to say though more than anything else. Not that he blamed him, he just had his dream mocked and rubbed in his face. By the very being that caused him all the pain he'd suffered in his life. At least as far as he knew. Boy! Karama then turned his attention to Daiki once more. I will not apologize for your parents, because I am not sorry. You should feel proud though, that the being they fell to was me. The mightiest and strongest of all. That's fine. Daiki shrugged, crossing his arms over his chest, gleaming scarlet meeting crimson red. Like I said, I don't blame you for it, it's just the way this world works, 
but I'll say one thing back and keep it mind. You won't be the strongest of the Bijou for long. I'll make sure Isabu surpasses you. Karama blinked. I see. So it's like that. The fool. The giant fox shook his head, then erupted into great peals of laughter, pure amusement vibrating the very air. A goal even more foolish than Naruto wanting to become Hokage. Good luck with that. And then he roared and a wave of pressure swept over him and the world warped around him. Suddenly, he was back in the physical world. Naruto held aloft in his hand by the throat. Naruto's eyes regained their focus and he kicked wildly in his grip, forcing the boy to drop him. The blonde landed on his backside and rubbed at his throat. That was interesting. Daiki mused inwardly, the thick tails of chakra behind him flicking back and forth through the air idly. Quite. I was not expecting Karama to be so accommodating. Isabu agreed. He afforded you, while not respect, at least a smidgen of courtesy in the matter of your parents. Yeah, he was not at all expecting Karamas, while not comforting words or an apology, but at least acknowledgement of him and the death of his parents at his hands. Yes, I believe your words to Naruto and not blaming him for his part in things and even believing him to be in the right with his actions, earned you a bit of goodwill with my sibling, Isabu mused. I don't doubt he would still kill you without a second thought if it meant gaining his freedom, but it is a start I believe towards gaining his cooperation. Ah, and there he was not even aiming for that. He didn't think it would be at all that simple and wouldn't amount to much beyond a tiny starting point, but it was a gain without going for it in the first place that he would happily accept. A cough drew him from his thoughts, and he looked down to see the boy with a grimace on his face and looking up at him. Were you telling the truth? Naruto asked. About being the next Hokage? All right. Naruto hadn't really believed him, but Kurama confirmed his words. Yeah, Daiki confirmed bluntly. Because of what led me to meeting and sealing the Sanbai inside me, the old man believes I'd be a good candidate, especially since with the full power of the Sanbai, I can fight on the level of the Hokage and protect the village. There's loads of requirements for being the Hokage, but the most important is being strong enough to do the job. Naruto visibly grit his teeth and stood up, hands clenching into fists. I thought there wasn't any shortcuts to being Hokage, yet you're telling me if I could use the fox's power, the old man would think of letting me be it? He asked. Daiki scoffed. Hell no, he replied flatly. Naruto, I told you there's more to it. You don't need to be the smartest or most knowledgeable to be Hokage, and while strength is the most important, it has to be accompanied with loyalty to the village and the maturity to know what being Hokage actually means. He uncrossed his arms and stared the boy directly in the eyes. You're not stupid, Naruto, but you're ignorant and you refuse to compromise. You don't understand the first thing about being a ninja, never mind being the Hokage, he explained. At your core, you're too soft and you don't have the mindset needed to do what's right for the village above all else which the Hokage needs. What? What do you mean I don't understand the first thing about being a ninja? Naruto's hands flexed. Daiki sighed. He couldn't blame him for not knowing. Daiki himself learned this lesson from Naruto himself when he was older after all. To be a ninja is to endure. That's what it means. You can't even truly endure being yourself. You constantly want attention. You lie awake at night wishing you had parents to love you. You yearn for affection. And you despair at being who you are and being a Jinchuriki. Daiki told him and lifted a single hand and pointed at him a finger of chakra extending from his own to poke him directly on the chest, over his heart. Here's a little advice from me to you. Get over it. You've got this far without parents, haven't you? You're strong, you don't need them. If you want love, don't look to the past for something that can't be. Look to the future. Find someone else to love you. Accept that the world is cruel and that people die. You can rage and cry about it, but then you have to move on. With a thought, he dispelled the chakra cloak from around his body and stepped up to the blonde, his image in Daiki's vision being superseded by an older one in a red cloak for a brief moment, and most importantly. He said as he thought about the Naruto whom he in another life had eagerly watched and held great love for. Yeah, Naruto trembled under his gaze. Such was the weight of this moment. Be proud of who you are, there's nothing wrong with being a Jinchuriki. Even if you put aside what I told you earlier without you, 
Nobody could hold back the QB and it would have destroyed the Leaf Village. You protected this village so hold your head high. Daiki smirked. Wear it like a crown. Something you alone accomplished that nobody else did. And it can't be used to hurt you. And always remember who you are. You're Naruto Uzumaki, the savior of the Leaf. The Jinchuriki of the strongest Bijou and above all else an enduring ninja that no matter how many times you get knocked flat on your butt. Will always stand back up. Daiki. Naruto bit his lip and tears began to bud in the corner of his eyes. Right? I... Get you I think. Daiki clapped him on the shoulder and turned away. Walking a few steps forward and reaching within himself once more. A familiar bubbling red cloak of chakra with three tails sprung into existence around him instantly. Now that we've got the heavy emotional crap out of the way, let's get down to business. Daiki looked over his shoulder with a smirk. Bring out the QB's chakra. Draw on it till you can form at least one tail. I'm gonna teach you how to use it properly. Oh, and use your sexy jutsu while you're at it. Eh. Naruto blinked at his words. The heavy emotion and tears in his gaze disappearing through the power of sheer confusion. Again. Naruto or rather. Naruko at the moment growled as she punched out her fist. Launching a massive claw of chakra over 20 feet in size through the air smashing through a boulder and pulverizing it to dust. Again, Daiki ordered. Fine! She growled as she reeled back in the chakra arm and then thrust out her other hand and launched another one that tore through a series of trees. Honestly, the area they were training in after an hour had passed looked like a war zone. Currently, Daiki was having the blonde run through some basic drills with using the one-tailed cloak she had managed to form around herself with only a little bit of complaint at the fox inside her. Karama, it seemed, was feeling a little bit more generous at the moment and let her pull on the one-tailed cloak without too much of a fuss. Though Daiki was betting that was more because his pride was hurt with how easily Daiki had slapped his Jinchuriki around earlier. Heh, others' pride was so useful to use to his benefit sometimes. Naruko snapped the chakra arm back a moment later and turned around to glare at him, crimson red eyes having replaced sapphire blue. Why do I gotta keep doing this? It's easy. I can already do it, she growled at him, before crossing her arms. And you still haven't answered why I have to train in my sexy jutsu, you damn pervert. Because I candy. He thought with a snort, idly glancing over the blonde. Because you're pretty good at using this technique on the fly and holding it alongside the chakra cloak, will make it much easier for you to use jutsu on the fly, he explained, which was true. He could have had him transform into anything or really use any other jutsu and I'm making you repeat it over and over because it's annoying you, and you need to learn how to suppress the anger that's seeping into you from the QB's chakra. The agitation in the Busta Blonde was plain to see and in stark contrast to Daiki himself, who was casually sitting atop a rock behind where the Blonde was training, head propped on his fist and his chakra cloak peaceful swaying around him. Naruko's eyes twitched. That doesn't mean I need to use my sexy jutsu. I could have transformed into anybody else. She huffed. You're just a perv Daiki. You already admitted to having the hots for my sexy jutsu back during the prelims, remember? Oh, right. He had, hadn't he? You did. Isabu snorted in amusement. Daiki shrugged. You caught me? He admitted. But since I'm spending my time training you and not doing my own training, I should at least get something nice to look at. Man, it really is too bad you weren't born a girl. I knew it. Naruko crowed. You're just a little pervert like Aero Senen. Hell no. I'm not some little pervert. Daiki scoffed. That title belonged to someone like Ebisu. Oh yeah. Naruto challenged and spread her arms. Then what are you? I'm a Giga Chad pervert. He replied proudly. I can't believe you're the next Hokage. Naruko slumped her head in defeat. The world isn't fair at all. I mean, can you really complain? Daiki pointed out with a snort. You're getting private training from the next Hokage himself, just because you're an utter babe in this form. It's just a transformation. I'm a guy. Naruko rolled her yes. You're leering at another guy right now. Not right now I'm not, right now you're a chick. He denied. Honestly, it's doing its intended purpose anyway. Didn't you make this technique to take advantage of perverts like you claim I am? Why not take advantage of me more for your own benefit? Well, yeah. But not like this, Naruko shrugged. I don't even get why you're so at ease with it. In return, Daiki shrugged. 
just taking in what might have been, he replied. You're kind of annoying normally, but if you looked were born a girl and looked like this naturally, I'd have already seduced you. Now, Naruko not being actually real, that was the world not being fair. Oh, screw you. Naruko rolled her eyes. Interesting. He had distracted her enough she was more indignant than agitated and angry. As expected, she was pretty well equipped to handling Karama's chakra. The problem with what he noted originally was that Jiraiya jumped ahead too quickly with her training. Instead of having him master the lower stages, he just loosened the seal and jumped to the higher stages. If only, Daiki smirked at her. Naruko's currently red eyes opened wide and her cheeks flushed. Not like that you pervert. She screamed and punched out at him. A massive red chakra claw shooting out towards him, only to get torn apart as a tail swept down over his head and tore it apart. While Daiki slipped off the rock he was sitting on to stand on his feet. Calm down. Calm down, Naruko. It was just a joke. Stop calling me that. The blonde huffed, cheeks blazing so dark, he could easily notice them through the bubbling cloak of chakra around her body. Nah, I'm not calling you Naruto while you're like this, Daiki laughed. But how about I make it up to you and teach you a jutsu? All embarrassment was immediately forgotten. A jutsu? Her head perked up, twin tails swaying noticeably with the motion. God, that was sexy. Truly the world was unfair. Yeah, I've got a good one in mind for you. Daiki stepped forward. I'm pretty sure you've got an affinity for the wind element, so I'll teach you the wind style, drilling air bullet. One of her biggest problems in the other timeline was her sheer lack of long-range techniques. That would go a long way with more control over the chakra cloak to dealing with that. Affinity? Naruko's head tilted to the side, confused, and he lost her. Don't worry about it. He walked past her, spanking her on the butt as he did, making the blonde yelp in shock. Let me just show you the jutsu real quick. Did you just freaking spank me, you perv? Naruko gaped at him and he swerved to the side to avoid another chakra claw aimed at his back. Why, yes, yes, he did. Hours later, when the sun hung low in the horizon and the sky turned a dusky red, Daiki found himself standing in the Hokage's office, two pairs of eyes giving him dry gazes, and had been doing so for the last minute. Seriously, kid? Jiraiya asked, voice deadpan. Don't act like you wouldn't have asked them same. Honestly, I bet you already have. Daiki smirked at him knowingly, a smirk which widened when Jiraiya grimaced and looked away. Besides, while I was doing it for the eye candy, I wasn't lying. Holding a technique while using his Jinchuriki powers will seriously help him in the long run and up his chakra control for sure. Honestly, I do believe I should have seen this coming. Haruzan shook his head. Really, if I didn't already know of your parents' Daikikuin, I would have assumed Jiraiya impregnated some poor girl and spawned you. As if, he wishes he could spawn someone as awesome me. Daiki snorted. Hey now, Sensei. That's a low blow. You know I've got a seal to make sure something like that doesn't happen. Jiraiya huffed. Anyway, I'm still not sure that was the best way to go about it, kid. You were a bit too blunt and he's still not really mastered the summoning jutsu either so giving him another jutsu to learn. An elemental one at that is a bit iffy I'm thinking. Learning more control of the Kyuubi's chakra will help with that and so will the jutsu itself the more he learns the better honestly and it'll translate into his other jutsu skills while at it or at least it does for me, Daiki shrugged. But don't go doing something stupid like loosening his seal anytime soon, I've given him a bit of a reality check, but Naruto is still way too emotional to be able to filter it all out. Honestly, for the next two weeks up to the final round, you should have him using the one-tailed cloak form constantly and practicing with his jutsu. Just be careful though, cause he'll be liable to lashing out if you piss him off enough right now and he should be tough enough with it to tear apart your average jonin. Very well, you are more or less the only reputable master of the subject at hand, We've never trained a Jinchuriki to use their power after all. Sarutobi mused, puffing on his pipe. Jiraiya, do as Daiki says, have him work on using the cloak as he did today and that shockwave attack, as well as the summoning jutsu and the drilling air bullet. Yeah, yeah. Jiraiya waved him off. I gotcha, sensei. Anyway, if that's all, I think I'll go keep an eye on the kid right now. I'm kinda leery of leaving him to himself right now while he's using that chakra. That would be for the best, Sarutobi nodded. Besides, I have things to talk about with Daiki in private anyway. Ah, uh, I see how it is. Jiraiya snorted, nodding his head. 
Little secret pow-wow with your new and all-time favorite student. Favoritism hurts you no know, sensei. Yes, as many women who have complained about a certain student of mine peeking on them in the hot springs and not being arrested have attested to. Sarutobi deadpan back. Huh. Wonder who did that. Sounds like a cool guy. Jiraiya laughed and proceeded to disappear with a shunshin. Hastily leaving the premises and the subject at hand behind. That boy will never grow up. Sarutobi snorted, then turned his attention to Daiki. So, let's get down to business, shall we? Daiki shrugged. Sure. I've decided, as you know that Anko will be your guard and escort to the Mist Village, he stated. You will be leaving tomorrow, at which time is your own choice. How you approach the negotiations is up to you, though do try not to offend the Mist too much. Don't worry about it. I've had two weeks to plan old man, Daiki replied. I can't guarantee they'll be all in for an alliance, but I'm pretty sure they'll at least not be aggressive towards us. Not with what he'd be giving back to them already with a possible offer. And the problems that stem from them he could use to throw shade at them in return for any claims they'd make. From Rin to Raiga and even Ao. It's good to see you're confident, the old man hummed. I'm at least confident enough myself in your strength to confirm your safety in the mission. Left unsaid was that the Mist was currently the weakest of the five great villages. Only an idiot would pick a fight with the strongest in their position, even if they weren't aware of Kanoha's precarious position. Good luck, Daikikuen. Sarutobi smiled at him warmly. No need for luck when I'm me, but I'll take it anyway, Daiki laughed lightly. Though, there is one thing I want to ask you old man before I leave, he said after a moment, his face turning serious. Oh! Sarutobi raised an eyebrow at him. Daiki eyed the liver spots on the old man's face for a moment, before speaking. If you had the chance to reverse your age and become young again, would you take it? He asked. Over the last two weeks, he'd gathered up enough chakra to restore the man to his prime and still leave quite a bit in the tank for his own usage if needed. I would not. The old man denied immediately making the boy blink. You wouldn't? He gaped. I would not. Sarutobi confirmed, closing his eyes for a moment, before opening them again to look into Daiki's own. My life has been hard and I have many regrets. I have lost a son and a daughter-in-law. I have lost my wife and too many members of this village to count. I will not ask why you are asking me this Daiki Kuen, but I will say this. Despite those regrets, I am happy with my life and want to live it to the natural conclusion, at which point I will join my wife my lost children and the leaves who have fallen from this great towering tree in the next world. But Daiki wasn't sure how to respond, so he didn't. It was regrettable since the old man back in his prime would be an absolute monster. But he would respect his decision. By the way, Daiki Kuen, Sarutobi's voice broke him from his thoughts and looked up, only realizing then that the man's words had caused him to look down at the floor, unable to meet his eyes. Here, a scroll fell from the old man's sleeve and was tossed towards the teen, who caught it easily. What's this? He asked. You'll be on the road for a few days, so you can get some reading done in the meantime in preparation, Sarutobi replied. That scroll contains the exercises you will need to go through to train with both the earth and fire element. Just because you are on a mission does not mean your beloved grind can come to a halt, no? Daiki couldn't stop his lips twitching back up into a smile. Definitely not. That's heresy after all. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.